to rest some people out. Yeah, we, we have to have 12 people to start. There's 11. 11. Dylan's getting some people. There's 12. All right. Well, then we lost. Then we lost Tomlinson. You're not allowed to leave again now. You have to stay. All right. We're good. We're good. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, good afternoon. This is the House Judiciary Committee. We're going to do bill hearings now. Uh, February the 1st. It's Wednesday. It's about 3.30. Thanks, everybody, for being here. We're going to start with House Bill 244, Delegate Terrassa. There are three people who are going to testify virtually. Um, uh, Alexis Burl Road, the Register of Wills for Baltimore County. Byron McFarland, who's the Register of Wills for Howard County. And Joseph Griffin, I think, is going to be joining us virtually, or maybe not. Maybe not. We don't have uh, Joseph Griffin, but we'll keep an eye out for him. Uh, we'll hear three minutes from Delegate Tarasa, two minutes from the other two witnesses so far. We'll see how we go. And with that, Delegate Tarasa, please, for three minutes. Actually, let me take a moment. Let's, we'll start her again here in a moment. But, uh, but I do need to remind, um, and I was reminded by Whitney, and, and it's getting a, she gently but firmly asks everyone, if your light is flashing, don't touch the button. We'll get there. It's, uh, if you touch the button, it screws up the whole system. The world comes to an end. And Whitney, it's very hard on Whitney. Please don't make it harder on Whitney. That's so anyway, with that, Delegate Tarasa for three minutes. Thank you, and I don't want the world to come to an end, so I won't touch any buttons. <laughs> okay, um, Chairman Clippinger and Vice Chairman Moon, members of the Judiciary Committee, thank you for this opportunity for, to present House Bill 244, which authorizes the registers of wills of Maryland to accept e-filing and also prohibits um, registers of wills from re requiring a wet signature. Currently, registers of wills operate under an outdated requirement that the documents filed with our offices must all be in paper form with wet original signatures. And as you probably know, most um, courts these days, federal and state, 23 out of the 24 jurisdictions in the state use e-filing. And the states, as you know, have been migrating from a paper filing system to this MDEC, or Maryland Electronic Court System. Um, for some reason, a decision was made years ago that the register of will, registers of wills would not be included in that MDEC system and, in fact, are prohibited, as I said, from accepting e-filing. The registers have been working um, within their existing IT budget with an IT team and cre to create a web-based system. Um, in the next few months, that should be ready, the, the web-based system, and then they should be ready to launch the e-filing portion within the next year. However, the problem is... Maryland law prohibits them from accepting those, um, that filing at, in anything other than physical form. So this simply allows um, a simple bill allowing uh, for e-filing and printing, which I think is going to save time and money, both of which are particularly important at stressful times. And I have a number of registers of wills with me to testify and also to answer your questions. Thank you. All right. Um, who would like to go first? Ms. Burrell Road or Mr. McFarland? All right, we're going to Alexis Burrell. No, he got, <laughs> did the hand thing first. So Alexis Burrell Road for two minutes, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Delegate. Um, so I, I um, wanted to add the e-filing e is sorely needed by the Register of Wills, and right now we're prohibited by rule from accepting anything other than um, a wet signature, which is really problematic in this day and age when most other court systems are if you're able to e-file. Um, I did want to add that we will be accepting electronic filings as well. We can still accept paper filings for people who use our office who do not have access to computers or are not computer savvy. So I think that was an important point to make. Also, again, this would incur no additional cost because it's built into our um, IT budgets. And this is something that um, the users of my office have been um, requesting for probably as long as I've been in office, but then before that when I was practicing in front of the Register of Wills. It's something that practitioners and the public alike have been um, requesting of our office. So in order to meet our 
constituent needs, it's very important that we um, move forward with this electronic filing. And I will um, end there. If anyone has any questions, I'm um, available. Ms. McFarland. All right, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanna thank Delegate Tarasa for sponsoring this bill uh, and for all the co-sponsors for, uh, for co-sponsoring it as well. Um, in the, uh, to respect all your time, I'm really just gonna say me too. Uh, we have um, a really dire need for us to move forward with this. Uh, this legislation would help us move forward with a rules change that we need to allow us to accept the filing. As uh, my colleague from Baltimore County has said, this is already budgeted for. Um, and I think if you look at the fiscal note, we're actually gonna save money by not having to print and handle as much paper files as we do now. Um, so we really wanna move in this direction and we hope that if this is enacted, we can get the rules changed and we can have this system up and running in about a year, year and a half. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, and, um, and with that, I, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there questions for the panel? Delegate Conaway. Chairman, thank you, Delegate, for bringing the bill. Mm -hmm. To the registers, thank you for coming in and testifying or testify via Zoom. Uh, I was wondering, how do you prevent fraud uh, or fraudulent signature from being filed with the will? So if that question's for me. Well, it could be for the, the registers. They, sure, they I think they can answer that as well, but I know that that is a system used in all the courts in Maryland. No, that's not what I asked. I didn't ask about the system. I'm asking, so, you, have, you have a wet signature, therefore you can look at a document and see what the person's previous signature was, and you can compare signatures to say, well, this looks like the person's signature. It doesn't look like the person's signature. How, how do we... Uh, look at the e-file and, and find out if who signed this and when. So you, you had mentioned initially, um, this is Alexis okay. Burrell Road Register from Baltimore County, about wills. And wills are not included in this electronic filing. So right now we don't have electronic wills. So wills are all going to still be in paper with original wet signatures. Um, there's likely something uh, down the road that we're not contemplating yet that many jurisdictions in other states have um, electronic wills. But um, right now, wills are not part of electronic filing. So it would be court filed documents. And what would happen is if you're going to use the system, you'd have to create an account and a login and um, verify who you are so that there's some indication when you file a document that you are who you say you are and you sign it electronically. So that would um, reduce the incidence uh, or concerns about fraud, similar to the federal system that has done um, electronic filing for uh, probably, I don't know exactly, but um, many, many years. And also MDEC is a, is functions in a similar way. So our system would function in that similar way where you set up a user account and it's authenticated. So the user account would be set up prior to a person uh, uploading information into the system. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you very much. Seeing no further questions, that appears to conclude the testimony and the questions for House Bill 244. We thank you very much. Thank you. And I won't touch any buttons. <laughs> okay. Thank you for not touching any of the buttons. House Bill 215 is next with Delegate Polakovich Carr. Uh, we will be hearing uh, from her and... There are three other people signed up to testify. I see two. Um, Jessica Emerson, Melanie Shapiro, Sam, uh, Samuela Ansa. And I see all three. All right, that's fine. Uh, we'll hear from, uh, from Delegate Polakovich Carr for three minutes, everybody else for two, and go from there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Colleagues, good afternoon. For the record, I'm Delegate Julie Polakovich Carr, here to present House Bill 215. This bill would ensure that every Marylander can summon the police, the fire department, or emergency medical services when they need it and not fear retaliation by their landlord or their local government. And for returning members of the committee, you may recall this bill from last year. This is a bill that passed this committee last session and passed the full house last session. 
The bill does two things. First, it addresses local nuisance laws, also known as crime-free housing ordinances, that find repeated use of emergency services. There are a small number of local jurisdictions in Maryland that have enacted these ordinances in the hopes of re addressing repeat criminal activity at particular properties. However, some of these local laws are drafted very broadly, and they end up punishing people who did nothing wrong and who legitimately need emergency services. Some local governments will find a property owner for as little as two calls for service within a 30-day period. And if there are repeated infractions, the property owner can actually lose their rental uh, license and or use of the property for up to a year. But usually it doesn't reach this point because as soon as the first call for service happens, the local government notifies the property owner, it could be the landlord, and then the landlord will typically evict the tenant um, after that first call for service rather than risking the fine or loss of their rental license. Uh, the second part of the bill ensures that landlords are not using lease language that punishes tenants for solely calling 911. As we know, there are numerous valid reasons why someone would call the police, first and foremost, because they were the victim of a crime and someone shouldn't lo risk losing their housing uh, because of it, they were a victim of a crime. And I think we can all agree that we want people to report criminal activity to law enforcement um, because it makes our community safer. But these nuisance laws actually stifle that flow of information. Um, these local laws and lease provisions also punish people when their neighbors act as good Samaritans in instances of cases of domestic violence. A neighbor's call for police in those cases could actually end up causing the victim to lose her housing. Um, there have been numerous studies and government reports that have noted the discriminatory impacts of local nuisance laws, especially against several protected classes of people, including people of color, victims of domestic violence, LGBTQ plus individuals, and people with disabilities. And to that end, a number of lawsuits have been successfully litigated in other jurisdictions and other states because of their local nuisance laws. So this bill would ensure the rights of residents to get help from 911 from, and from emergency services by barring local nuisance laws from penalizing landlords and residents for solely calling 911. Nine other states have passed similar legislation, and the bill prohibits a landlord from evicting or threatening to evict a tenant solely based on the summoning of police or emergency assistance, and 11 other states have passed similar laws. And I'll just note that we do have supporters here today, and you'll see from the written testimony in support of the bill that both advocates for renters and landlords support this legislation. Thank you. We could just go straight down the line. That'd be fine. Great. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jessica Emerson, and I direct the Human Trafficking Prevention Project, an organization focused on providing legal services to sex workers and survivors of trafficking, as well as advocating for systemic change designed to prevent exploitation from occurring. The HTPP and the Maryland Human Trafficking Task Force support this bill because it will reduce the likelihood that all victims of crime, including survivors of human trafficking, will be deterred from requesting assistance in times of emergency. Additionally, uh, reducing the likelihood of eviction for any tenant reduces their risk of becoming a victim of trafficking. So as you heard the delegate state, some local ordinances defined excessive calls to police or emergency services as nuisances, even when the tenant is specifically contacting these services because they've been the victim of a crime. This deters overall reporting of crime and places victims in heightened danger, resulting in some being afraid to call for help out of fear of eviction. The existence of nuisance ordinances can also deter landlords from renting to crime victims in order to reduce the likelihood that they will face these financial penalties. And additionally, nuisance ordinances are routinely used to target black and brown communities for eviction and displacement, who are already disproportionately impacted by the majority of risk factors that put people at risk of exploitation. In addition to deterring victims of crime from calling emergency services, both housing instability and homelessness factor heavily into recruitment and control for traffickers, who commonly offer safe shelter as a coercive means of recruitment, only to use the victim's fear of being turned back out onto the street as a means of control. In addition, traffickers can use the existence of these nuisance laws to further their control over victims by reminding them that if they try to reach out and call for help, they'll be fined or evicted. In recent years, Maryland has begun to show its support for preventing human trafficking by addressing the discrimination and oppressive practices that make people more vulnerable to exploitation. And HB 215 would further this goal by reducing the likelihood of homelessness for rental tenants. And for these reasons, the HTPP and the task force urge a favorable, favorable report. Right under the bell. <laughs> First shot. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. I'm Melanie Shapiro. I'm the Public Policy Director with the Maryland Network Against Domestic Violence. MNADV is the federally recognized state domestic violence coalition, and we are here in support of House Bill 215. 
like to thank Delegate Polakovich Carr for her efforts on this bill um, and all of you who voted in support of it last year um, and encourage all of you to vote in support of it again this year. Homelessness impacts 38% of victims of domestic violence. They will experience it at some point in their lives. And so what this bill will do is address that economic and housing instability. And for victims of domestic violence, it is one of the most underreported crimes, if not the most underreported crime already, with over half of all incidents of domestic violence going unreported. These types of laws perpetuate that by discouraging individuals from calling for emergency services when they need it. They could call emergency services when they're in a situation living with their abuser, or they may have established a safe residence somewhere else, and the abuser comes in violation of a protective order. And in either one of those circumstances, they could be, in fact, evicted simply by calling for emergency services. In addition, um, as Ms. Emerson already stated, the nuisance laws could be used to threaten a victim by silencing them and stating um, if, if they call by their abuser, threatens if they call, you know, we're going to get evicted, and so preventing them from reporting the abuse that they occur. For all of those reasons, we urge a favorable report on House Bill 215. Um, thank you, Chair Clippinger, Vice Chair Moon, and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Samuela Ansa, and I'm the voting rights advocate at Disability Rights Maryland, where we work to protect and advance the rights of all Marylanders with disabilities. And I'm pleased to be here in support of House Bill 215. Um, in our written testimony, we've highlighted um, the experiences of clients who've um, been evicted or had notices to vacate. Um, for calling emergency services, and I'll highlight just two. There was a woman with intellectual disabilities in an abusive relationship, and in an instance of violence called the police for assistance, who arrested and jailed her abuser, um, but it was served a notice to vacate for doing so. Um, there was also a mother who was blind, um, who accidentally set an egg carton um, on top of her stove on fire. She was able to extinguish the fire herself, um, but the fire alarm alerted the fire department who appeared and was served a notice to vacate. Um, evictions really harm people with disabilities who are using vouchers or housing assistance to be able to afford living in their home um, and to, um, I'm sorry, and jeopardize, and evictions will jeopardize um, their ability to access um, accessible units um, that they need for people with physical disabilities. No one should ever have to choose between stable housing or calling for life-saving emergency, uh, life uh, emergency services. So for these reasons, D Disability Rights Maryland and all the signed on organizations on our written testimony urge a favorable report on House Bill 215. Thank you. Questions for the panel. Delegate Conaway. Mr. Chairman, thank you for coming in to testify, witnesses and delegate. On uh, page four of the bill, it says the installation and use of a residential security alarm system. And you spoke, uh, one of the witnesses spoke about the fire alarm going off. Were they, were, was the tenant or the leasee, were they able to sue the uh, company for wrongful termination of lease? I can get back to you with that answer. Okay. And I was wondering if, if your alarm system malfunctions, the battery goes bad, and it starts calling the alarm system every week or every two weeks the police, would, would that come under this bill? Or? It does not. So basically what that provision of the bill is saying that local governments can have laws that would fine a property owner in that exact situation. And actually a number of county governments do have that law on the books right now. Okay. Thank you very much. Delegate Cardin, then Delegate Simmons. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a quick question. So if we pass the bill and the local municipalities or jurisdictions um, are get rid of these ordinances and then somebody calls and then they get evicted, do they have an action against the landlord? And can this be used as evidence against the landlord if they get evicted for doing it, even though it's already been prohibited, but the landlord is just two or three years behind in understanding what the changes in the ordinance are. That would be question number one, um, as we're learning a little bit about proceeding here, a little bit about landlords can sometimes be um, a little bit slower in doing, um, in, in following through. That would be number one. And number two is, have you spoken to the Women's Law Center 
did, they're, they're opposing the bill. This is for you, for, for the delegate. Um, they're opposing the bill according to testimony, and I'm not sure why, so. Uh, this is actually the first I'm hearing of their opposition. Sorry, with not being on the committee, got a dump of the, the testimony yesterday, so it's we'll have to circle back with them. <laughs> um, to answer your first question, I'll just say that the bill doesn't actually require that local governments repeal their ordinance. It just says that they can't use calls for services the basis. So there actually are a number of uh, municipalities and counties in Maryland whose ordinances, although they have nuisance ordinances, would not have to change them. Uh, per this bill because they use other things like arrests or convictions or police reports as the standard for their nuisance law. So they could continue on as they are um, if they're using that threshold, but there are five jurisdictions that would need to make changes or repeal their ordinance under this bill. But if a, and if a landlord then winds up um, try, attempting to evict somebody based on the actions of the person, not on violation of the ordinance, can this, then this be used, at, I mean, you, you talk about, in the fiscal note, it talks about how this can be used to get damages against the municipality. What about against the landlord? Any idea? Maybe the one- We'll circle lawyer. back with you. Okay. <laughs> Wait a minute. Delegate Simmons, then Delegate Tolls, then Delegate Young. Thank you all for your testimony. Uh, just a quick scenario. Uh, if I'm a landlord and uh, I'm renting out a house, and in that house I rented it to two people, and now there are ten people there and they're using drugs and other things that uh, calls for service to the police keep coming to that resident, it shouldn't be within my peer review to get rid of them? No, it should be, and the bill pre would preserve the rights of landlords to do that. We worked very closely last session um, with uh, MMHA and the realtors. They actually are both supporting the bill. Um, it's very specific. It's solely the summoning of police. So the fact that 911 was called because somebody wanted to report that illegal activity at the property, that couldn't be the basis, but the fact that there actually, say, was an arrest or actual, you know, a police report documenting the criminal activity taking place, you would certainly be within your rights, you know, subject to other state law to evict. Delegate Tolls. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That was my question. I wanted to know if criminal activity occurred, what would be the basis of um, eviction? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is one of those instances where you see your intern and you want to just ask a question so you can acknowledge her good work. <laughs> Samuel, I'm really proud of you. Um, but I do have a real question, though, which is, um, obviously, you, you mentioned, Delegate, that there's going to be five jurisdictions, and I see in the fiscal and policy note what those jurisdictions are that need to adjust their laws. Just wondering if y'all have had a conversation with any of them. I don't see any testimony from them in favor or against, or if MAKO has uh, been contacted, just to get a sense of what their position might be. Yes. Uh, I don't believe MAKO has taken a position on the bill this year. Last year, they did support the bill with amendments, and actually, the, the version of this bill that passed the committee in the House addressed MAKO's concerns, so they were favorable in the posture the bill passed in last year. Um, but as I said, I don't think they have a position this year. Um, I'll say of the five jurisdictions that we know of in Maryland that would be impacted, uh, two of them actually have not been using their authority. So to them, it actually makes no difference because they aren't using it currently. Thank you so much. Whose intern are you? I was Delegate Young's intern when he was at the ACLU. Uh, <laughs> does anyone have many, many more questions for, for, never mind. All right. Are there further questions for the panel? All right. No, stop stirring stuff up. All right. Uh, you do? Okay. Delegate Tolls, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm so sorry. Quick follow-up. Could you um, let me know how um, um, human trafficking, Jessica, is impacted by, like, how would this legislation benefit human trafficking? I did a lot of human trafficking work when I was on the county council, so I wanted to know how this would impact it. Yes. Um, well, like any other victims of crime, um, without these ordinances, they can be deterred from actually calling for um, assistance. But I think the bigger thing, the bigger piece, at least to, to us, in terms of preventing exploitation, is that any time there's housing instability or homelessness, what that can necessitate is a decision to enter into a dangerous situation, right? Or make someone ripe to be recruited by someone who is looking to exploit that individual for their labor um, because someone needs a, a safe place to live. I can't count the number of clients that I've worked with in over 
at this point, embarrassingly, 20 plus years of working with survivors, where I probably could count on two hands the number where um, homelessness or housing instability did not play into um, someone's vulnerability to being trafficked. So this, this is a preventative measure, preventive, preventative, whichever the right word is, uh, measure uh, designed to reduce vulnerability for trafficking and interpersonal violence for all individuals who rent, not specific to trafficking survivors. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, Delegate Carr, does this um, play into like, if people have vouchers or anything of that nature, like if they get called on, could it impact their vouchers getting um, taken away or having some issues with obtaining vouchers or keeping their vouchers? That's a great question. I actually don't have a specific answer if anyone else on the panel knows. Otherwise, we'll follow up. Okay, that's fine. I mean, any any eviction um, can can impact your voucher. So it's just an additional piece. Okay, so. Of vulnerability okay. for these individuals. Okay, yeah, that's, I mean, unfortunately, um, people do, um, need vouchers and what I'm concerned with is that gray area where you know you can have a situation where if maybe their child what we've seen before is doing some criminal activity and the parent has the voucher and unfortunately you know it could be impacted with them receiving you know those benefits or you know so I just I know that's a big issue when it comes to evictions, and I just wanted to know more specifically how this... And I will say in other mm -hmm. states, there definitely have been situations where that has played out. I'm not aware of any specifically in Maryland mm -hmm. where, say, a young adult who lives with their grandparent, whatever, gets into trouble, police get called out, and they end up losing their housing and their voucher for that reason because of another member of the household. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Delegate Simmons. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just want to double back because I'm trying to understand the rationale behind when you talk about uh, sex crimes uh, uh, and how did that relate to housing because in my experience uh, having that component of being able to be alerted to those type of houses have allowed uh, me and my capacity in law enforcement to go in and rescue people out of those conditions where they're most of the time being held against their will so I'm trying to figure out how do y'all I'm, I'm not really getting the message but I think again there's two different issues okay so a call for criminality right. is a different story than a victim calling for assistance. Okay. And so the impact or the ability of law enforcement to act on the potential for criminalization is not impacted. Okay. Right? This is just about if I am a victim of a sex crime and I call for help, I shouldn't be evicted because of that. Okay. Because I that is only going to make things worse for me. Okay. Right? Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't impact necessarily the ability of law enforcement to act on a criminal tip. Those are two different things. It's about calling for assistance from law enforcement saying, I've been the victim of a crime, or calling emergency services because I've been the victim of a crime. Um, those are the things that this particular bill would impact. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions for the panel? Seeing none, thank you all very much. Thank that you. concludes the testimony for House Bill 215. We're now going to go to House Bill 256. This is with Delegate Cardin, who's heading up. Uh, while he's getting organized, so members of the committee, if you're having items delivered to you in the committee room, they should be taken next door to the committee suite. Um, left at the front desk, and then we'll get a message around to you that there's something for you there, and you can go and pick it up. They shouldn't be coming behind the horseshoe uh, when we're in hearing. So we'll we'll go from there. Um, and if you have any more questions, you can ask Dylan. Um, House Bill 256. We'll hear from Delegate Cardin, um, Chad Fison, J.B. Osborne, Dennis Simpson, Anisha Griffin should be virtual. Anyone? She's there. Okay. And Lawrence Frank. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, um, members of the committee. For the record, John Cardin, on behalf of uh, House Bill 256, this is a bill that um, those members who have been here before will, re will remember. And those of you who are new, um, this may be a little bit complicated, but we have some really articulate people that will follow me that can answer any questions. The crux of the matter is that um, Maryland is one of a handful of states that does not prohibit duty to defend clauses for design professionals from state and private contracts. 
What this means in English is that the state or municipal contracts uh, for major construction projects almost always contain clauses that require the design professionals to pay all defense costs for all parties, regardless of whether they are the party at fault, um, arising out of litigation based on tort or negligence. So um, it doesn't matter who the wrongdoer is, until that wrong term doer is identified by a judge, the design professional, the architect, or the engineer on the, on the project is required to pay for all litigation, regardless of their fault. So if a design professional is determined to be the party at fault, um, they should and they do indemnify all other parties and pay for all the costs. That's the way it should be. However, they shouldn't have to pay for all their costs if they're not the party at fault. Um, and that is what we are trying to accomplish here. Um, there are 19 other states that have determined that this is against these types of contract clauses are against public policy. We believe, given the nature and the philosophy of Maryland government, that this should also be against uh, public policy in Maryland. Um, that's the essence of the bill. And uh, again, if you have any questions, these guys will be the ones to answer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Chairman Clippinger, Vice Chair Moon, and members of the House Judiciary Committee. I'm Chad Faison, the Executive Director for the American Council of Engineering Companies of Maryland. Uh, our organization represents 90 engineering firms here in Maryland with about 7,000 residents. Um, with that membership, approximately 40% are of the small business uh, DBE or WBE um, designation. And I do want to make sure we did submit our written testimony, so I, I don't plan to summarize that by no means. Um, and I will say that we are dedicated to working with the Attorney General's office um, to make sure that this is a, a bill that both sides are happy with on that. Uh, I hope for a favorable favorable report, and I will yield my time to my colleagues. Let's hear from Ms. Griffin, please. Ms. Griffin, for two minutes. She's You're on, on mute. mute. Need to restart the clock when she's off mute. Go ahead and try again. Hi. Uh, Chairman Clippinger, Vice Chair Moon, and members of the House Judiciary Committee, uh, my name is Anisha Griffin, and I am testifying today as the owner of a certified small minority business enterprise um, firm, as well as past chair of the Small Business Committee for the American Council of Engineering Companies of Maryland, um, also known as ACEC Maryland, uh, in support of House Bill 256. Other representatives from ACEC Maryland are speaking here today on the broad concerns about indemnification clauses and the duty to, to defend our clients even in cases where the design uh, professional is not liable for negligent performance. I am here today to speak to the potential catastrophic impacts that these clauses have on small firms. Firms like mine quite often serve as a sub-consultant to large firms, providing the support and specialized expertise that these firms need to deliver projects to our clients. In our ro role, we are generally not afforded the opportunity to negotiate contract terms, as those are negotiated by the prime contractors and then flow down to us. Uh, those contract terms are generally reasonable and we have the means to mitigate risks uh, through the insurance that we do carry. However, contract terms that require indemnification against claims that are potentially not attributed to our negligent errors and omissions are not covered by our professional liability insurance. Unless it is determined that we were negligent um, and only to the extent that the damages were caused by our negligence. This means that small firms could be, uh, could be responsible for paying significant sums of money that are not covered by our insurance policies for damages that were not caused by factors within our control, and small firms often do not have the financial means to incur these costs without reimbursement and still remain in business. These clauses have the potential to put small firms out of business and uh, for something that is not our fault. Um, we believe that this bill provides reasonable protections for all parties involved, um, and if indemnification is um, appropriate because we were at fault, then that is still permitted. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, Chairman Clippinger, Vice Chairman Moon, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dennis Simpson. I'm testifying today as chair of the Legislative Committee for the American Council of Engineering Companies. 
of Maryland in support of House Bill 256. Design professionals should not be asked to identify or defend another party for losses the designer did not cause, cannot insure against, and were caused by factors beyond the designer's control. Unfortunately, some public authorities and private businesses and entities are still putting indemnification clauses in their contracts that require a design professional to broadly identify and to defend those clients or their other parties against claims, regardless of whether the design professional is at fault, which goes beyond what the design professional's professional liability insurance will cover. When design professionals, including small minority and women-owned firms, refuse to agree to these provisions, they are not selected to these contracts. The fundamental purpose of this bill is fairness. Right now, design professionals are being asked to contractually commit to defend public and private entities against third-party claims before there is any determination that the design professional has committed any error or has approximate caused the damages. The cost of these def such defense can be staggering and comes out of the design professional's pocket not their professional liability insurance. The reason being the professional liability insurance will only cover legal costs in the extent caused by the negligent errors and omissions of the design professional does not provide the defense for its client. House Bill 256 would preclude the assignment of liability to design professionals for injuries or damages for which they are not the proximate cause. However, they did not inhibit the filing of claims or the limit of reasonable liability of those responsible, nor would it reduce the awards payable to any claimant. Design professionals are willing to and assume liability that can be attributed to their fault, but have genuine concerns with contracts requiring indemnification or duty to defend claims, for which they are not the proximate cause of the loss, damage, or expense. A favorable report on House Bill 256 would be appreciated. Thanks. Sorry. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chair, members of the committee. J.B. Osborne, again, here with ACEC Maryland. Um, there's not much that I can say today that, that I think these more articulate folks haven't already said, and I just want to thank our sponsor, Delegate Cardin, as well as uh, Delegate Taylor and Atterbury as well, and um, ask for your, for your favorable support. The one, the one issue of clarification that I will make is we, we are often asked, what is, the, what is the problem and what is this duty to defend and are you not willing to defend your designs as design professionals? And, and the duty to defend is, is, a, is a really a simple but often misunderstood um, concept that is, is in almost every insuring agreement that you will see in an insurance policy. So the insurance carrier typically will agree not only to pay losses and damages on behalf of the insured if they cause those damages, but also assumes a duty to defend the insured against any lawsuit that is brought against, regardless of whether that lawsuit has merit or is frivolous, or regardless of whether the, the insured is, is improperly named as a, as a case of mistaken identity. Design professionals are not in the business of providing insurance. Design professionals are in the business of providing design services, design professional services. When these clauses are inserted into design professional agreements, not only is the design professional now obligated to provide professional services, but if things go awry on the project, they're often expended, expected then to become the insurance company that provides and pays for the defense of the claim. Now, what's the problem with that if the design professional turns out to be at fault? Probably nothing, because those costs probably would have been incurred to begin with, right? The problem that, we, that we're concerned with is that complex construction projects can involve many, many parties, all of whom are expected to stand behind the work that they did on the project, including the owner. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there questions uh, for this panel? I have some. Um, Good. The Delegate Cardin, you indicated there are 19 states that do not have the duty to defend or do have the duty to defend? No, there are 19 states that have prohibited them. From, what, from the research we've done, and there are different, there are different statutes in different um, states, but there are 19 of them that presently prohibit these types of uh, clauses in contracts. What are those states? You gonna, can you help me with that? I can't give you all 19, but uh, the latest ones have been coming from Virginia, North Carolina, Georgia, California. It, it runs the gamut between Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts um, but we can get you the full list if you'd like. Okay. Um, at the beginning of the testimony, Dolly, you, you indicated that the 
design professional has to pick up the full cost. I don't think you intended to, but you implied that the full cost would have to be picked up of defense, no matter whether or not the underlying contractor was ultimately held liable. This isn't about total liability all the time. This is a duty to defend at the initial stage. Is that correct? You want to? Can I, can, I, can I pass sure, it on to course. Mr. Osborne? Yeah, yeah the, the problem with the duty to defend is that it's triggered at the onset of the claim. So as soon as the allegation uh, is made, and so if I, if I can just give a, a hypothetical situation, you have a complex construction project for a, for a bridge or a highway project, and there's a problem in that, let's just use a catastrophic example, the bridge collapses. At the time the bridge collapses, we don't know whether or not the collapse was caused by a design defect a construction mistake, a failure to maintain the bridge. All we know is we've got a big problem, and, there's, and now there's a lawsuit. At the onset of that claim, a duty to defend would obligate the design professional under its agreement, if tendered, to not only defend its design if it's a party to the claim itself, but whether or not it's a party to the claim to also defend the owner of the bridge and potentially other parties who were involved in that contract uh, project arrangement because they've assumed the duty to defend the claim if there's just a mere allegation that the bridge fell down because it must have been designed improperly. But your costs in defending would be picked up if it was proved that the, de the, the design professional didn't have anything to do with it. If it was somebody else's fault, you would be able to get that money back from somebody else, correct? Depending on the contract arrangement, you would, you would need a contractual recovery mechanism in order to get that money back. In other words, those costs are out the door in paying the lawyers to defend the claim only to successfully prove that it was somebody else's fault. You would have to then seek another cause of action to recover attorney's fees. And, and in, in America, unless there's a statute on point or there's some sort of public policy arrangement, there's really not a right to recovery legally for attorney's fees that you incurred. Um, so, the, so the challenge is that we've contractually obligated to pay for our client or somebody else's attorney's fees in the event of a claim, and that's an enforceable obligation currently under the status of the, of the law in Maryland. But in the contracts that you sign presently, isn't it true that you have those rights to recovery that are included in your contracts? I'm so not you, you don't uh, you don't include those rights to recovery in your contracts that you have presently. Yes, yeah, so so it depends on the the whether this is a public or a private negotiated contract. But oftentimes, design professionals, unlike many other professionals, aren't in, don't have that same bargaining power that other professionals have, where the professional dictates the terms and conditions of the contract. Oftentimes, we're asked to submit in and in, in a competitive procurement with others, and the form of contract that's to be used um, has already been established by the owner. So those, those fee shifting or risk shifting provisions are already set and there's very little room to negotiate those in, in the sort of the competitive procurement um, arrangements. But you don't then, you, you then as a rule don't, re don't request that ability to recover in, in contracts? I think when we have the ability to recover, we would have a prevailing party uh, provision or those types of things. We have the ability to negotiate those contracts. Um, the, the challenge for, for design professionals in particular is the, the ability to actually have a fair and reasonable negotiation when it comes to terms and conditions of the contract um, separate and apart. So, so, you know, other professionals, lawyers, for example, when you have a client that's interested in your services, you typically send them an engagement letter. It includes all of the provisions of this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm not going to do. Architects and engineers typically provide a scope of work, but the legal terms and conditions and the minutiae of the contract is often drafted and, and delivered by the project owner saying this is the contract we're going to use for, for this particular project. So the project's owner then sets the contract, you sign the contract, who does the underlying contractor sign the sign contracts with? The, you mean the construction contract? Effectively, yes. The, yeah, the, the people who you are at least presently in, indemnifying. Yeah, so typically the, a provision on a design professional contract would say that the design professional, the architect, the engineer, agrees to indemnify, defend, and hold the owner the owners, agents, employees, officers, directors, contractors, subcontractors, and anybody else involved with the project. I mean, that list could go on. We try to narrow it when we have the ability to negotiate the contracts. We try to narrow it just to maybe our direct client. Um, but if we have to assume now the defense obligation of all those other indemnified parties, um, you know, again, that, that's, a, that's a risk that we really can't control if any one of them gets sued relative to the, to the project. So who does the subcontractor sign a contract with? 
in those in, in these projects? So it depends Pick on the subcontractor. Yeah. So so a typical procurement for that bridge that I described, the owner would let the project and say, I need an architect or an engineer to, to design the bridge for me. They would enter into a contract with the engineer who would then enter into subcontracts with perhaps a structural engineer, a geotechnical engineer, and others who would design the project. That set of plans would then be put out to bid, and the contractor bidding on the project would enter into a contract with the owner, not with the design professional, excuse me, to build the project, and that contractor would then have subcontractors with his trade contractors, the, the concrete, the mason, the, you know, the steel fabricators, those types of subcontractors. Is there a, who else acts as a single point of contact, I guess, for the, for the contract as a whole? Is it the design professional or just the owner of the, of the project? Typically the owners or the owner's representative, which would be like a construction manager or an owner's rep entity that is hired to, to provide those services. But the, the people who are doing the design work are effectively work, or have contracted with the owner and, and those are the people, generally speaking, the government more often than not. Uh, I, I guess that's where I'm start, I kind of start to run in a circle is, is there then, the, the owner is the government, and they have contracted with the design professionals and others, but certainly the design professional seems like one of the first points of contract, uh, contact for the project and for the contract. So that's where I get kind of hung up a little bit. But I, I see other questions now, and I've talked too long. So Delegate Tomlinson, and then we'll go to Delegate Phillips. Thank you. Um, I think probably the question's for Mr. Osborne. Um, in your opinion, do you think that this would, would other professions then be coming wanting to uh, look for this kind of protection as well? So when you say other professions, are you, are you talking about other licensed professionals? Y yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, I, do, I don't think it, it really impacts other quote-unquote professionals in the same way that it does design professionals for the reason I sort of mentioned before, which is Lawyers tend to dictate the terms and conditions of representation. Accountants, doctors, you can't go get surgery without signing your life away to, to, the, to the medical treating physician that, you know, whatever happens, the, you understand the risks, this, that, and the other. Those professionals don't typically agree to, def doctors don't typically agree to defend their patients against lawsuits that may be brought against the patient. Um, lawyers don't typically defend their clients. But what all of the professionals have in common is that sort of concept of, of professional malpractice, professional negligence, there's a standard of care that needs to be met. And if you don't meet that standard of care, then that's sort of the definition of negligence. And if you're negligent, then that insurance is expected to pay to make your client or your customer whole or to pay those damages on your behalf, what, it, what it's not designed to do. And, and in fact, to defend the professional against those claims that may be brought for professional malpractice, but certainly not to defend the patient against claims brought against the doctor or to defend, in, the, in our case, the, the architect or the engineer's client against lawsuits that may be brought against them. Does that answer your question, Delegate? Thank you. Thank you. So, Delegate you could, um, and, and I think I understand this one. This kid goes back to my corporate days. Um, but if you could help us understand particularly why this impacts the small um, engineering firms, because we talked about insurance, and we talk about why the insurers are not um, paying the, for the defense work associated with everyone else. Because I think that's the crux of the matter, correct? Because otherwise, we just insure ourselves and we take care of this, right? So let, let me just say that that is the crux, and I didn't highlight that as well enough. But it, and I think that maybe your Mario own business, and Mr. Osborne can elaborate. But let me just say. For those of us who are who do not practice in this area, me included, um, if this was this was the first thing that Attorney General Anthony Brown asked us, and he had two meetings with me, called me on Saturday night at eight o'clock to say, "Let me understand this again. Um, why don't they just get insurance to cover this?" And the answer is, and Mr. Osborne is one of the attorneys who represents these firms. There is no insurance policy available that would cover this, and therefore it's out-of-pocket costs, which makes it in, inhibits the ability for minority-owned businesses to be able to even bid on it because the risk and the exposure is too great 
for them if they wind up having to cover these defense costs on a cause of action that was not their fault, they could be out of business before they can uh, create, um, file, file a claim to recover the costs from another company. So I think I've does that answer your question? It answered my question. Okay. Thank you. We found in government contracting, correct? Your contracts with the state. I mean, you mentioned private contracts too, but I'm assuming it's just mostly an issue with state contracting. It's really a, a, an issue industry-wide whether or not we're contracting with the state government, municipal governments, public contracts in general, or private entities. So, you know, again, it, if, I, if I can bring it into very simple terms, if you are a homeowner and you're, you buy a piece of land and you want to build your house and you hire an architect to design your house and your architect designs your house for you, uh, you're entering into a contract. If that contract required the architect to defend the homeowner every time somebody slipped and fell on the sidewalk leading to the house, we would say, well, that's unreasonable to expect that. So you don't see it in those very small private contracts, but when you get into the public contracts, those contracts are for massive, potentially hundred a million or to billion dollar projects, and there's so many parties involved that that contracting bargaining power that we talked about kind of goes away. So, so the concern presents itself more often in these complex infrastructure projects uh, because there's so many parties involved. But it is not an issue that is unique to private or public contracts. It exists everywhere, and the, and the, the concern is, again, having to defend any client or any party for damages that we didn't cause, right? So it, right. It, this is not about recovering those defense costs if it turns out that the architect or the engineer was at fault. Okay. Thank you. Delegate Conaway. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I'll get in panel for coming in to testify. So the, the, the lawsuit part of this wouldn't take the effect until after the project is complete. Is that correct or it's not correct? It's, it, it may not be correct. So if you think about um, just in a, in a sense of, let's just say, during construction before completion, there was a, a auto accident on a highway in the work zone. Um, there could be a lawsuit for an accident involving a work zone, and potentially the plaintiff's attorney in that claim would, would of course, sue everybody that ever touched the project. But in, in the event the engineer who designed the project was brought into that, the owner, by virtue of the contract, could also tender the defense of its responsibility as the project owner to the engineer who designed it before anybody's established that it was actually the configuration of the roadway that caused the accident and not just simple negligence of the driver. So. Um, so because the highway is being used, but it's still under construction, therefore the, the suit could take place before the construction is complete. That's what you're saying. Yeah, the, during the pendency of construction. Thank mm -hmm. you. Delegate Williams. Thank you. All right, so I just want to make sure I'm wrapping my head around this. Um, so you mentioned that with these large contracts, and this you typically will come up in large contracts where there is multiple different contractors and subcontractors. Is that correct? Is where this would typically arise. So I guess my question is, with those contractors, are there any other professionals that are involved in these large contracts that have this type of uh, prohibited Im immunity that you guys are seeking? So, the, so when it comes to licensed professionals, uh, probably not unless there was perhaps real estate services or something involved, but typically it's the engineer who has that professional duty and then the, the trade contractors, while, while certainly skilled contractors are not what we would consider licensed professionals under a, a state regulation or licensing requirement. Um, but I think, I think the key here that makes design professionals unique is, is how we procure insurance. So, so to, to the delegate's point earlier about, well, if, the, if insurance existed, wouldn't we just all buy insurance? And general contractors and most trade contractors have insurance, general liability insurance, which, which includes what they call broad form indemnification coverage, which, as m most of the lawyers in, in the room know, covers 
not only legal liability that you have, but also written contracts where you agree to assume the tort liability of somebody else, your insurance carrier as a contractor will come in and step into your shoes and to fulfill that role because you've contractually agreed to it. That's all well and great until you talk about what general liability insurance design professionals can purchase. We purchase general liability for simple accidents, simple negligence, but that policy excludes any claim that arises out of the performance of professional services. Where we fill that gap is with professional liability insurance, which contains an exclusion in almost every policy that says that if you agree contractually to assume an obligation that you wouldn't otherwise have legally, then there's no coverage under this policy. In other words, it's intended to cover your professional legal liability for negligence, not, not whatever contractual obligation you agree to with, um, you know, with a customer or a client. So it, we, get, we get an exclusion under the general liability that otherwise would probably be the mechanism to pick up this risk, and then we have an exclusion under the professional policy, which expressly excludes those contractual assumptions of risk. So again, we get stuck where then it becomes, do we do the work, do we sign the contract and face that uninsurable risk, or do we walk away from the, from the work altogether because we don't like the contract? Um, so it's sort of a catch-22 for design professionals. Okay, so because of that, none of the other professionals, though, have this prohibition is basically what you're saying. Yeah, I don't think it's a concern for, for the, the general contractor on the job because they would take that claim, take that obligation, and tender it to their insurance carrier, and they wouldn't be subject to that exclusion for the performance of professional services. So we're the only ones I think that I can think of on a typical construction job. Now, Design professionals includes not only engineers, architects, but also you know land surveyors, uh, landscape architects, any of those regulated design professionals as, as we would consider them under the, the various licensing statutes. And those are articulated in our in our bill. Right. But in, another question. So I guess the duty to defend them, though, but that still applies to everyone across the board. It would. Who, well, I'm sorry. All the contractors that are involved in the contract. Yeah, it depends on, on the contract, and, and to, to the chairman's point earlier, who, who hires who on the project and who reports to who, who is the main point of contact. There are, there are several different contracts in place, one with the design professional, which has its own indemnification and duty to defend provision, and a separate contract with a general contractor who's going to build it. And so if they've contractually agreed to that, that's, that's a decision that the contractor has made to accept that risk but the contracting community typically can transfer that obligation to or ensure that obligation where we just get stuck with not being able to, to properly or adequately transfer that risk to, to anyone other than the, you know, sort of the firm that's, that's taking on the job. And, and so again, big firms have this problem, small firms have this problem, but one claim could be catastrophic to a small firm if they if they weren't negligent but had to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars of legal fees for a claim they didn't, didn't have any fault in. And here in Maryland, how many times has that occurred? So that's a loaded question. I, I don't, there, are, there are reported, um, I'm not sure if they're reported or unreported opinions um, from the Court of Special Appeals um, here in Maryland and then, of course, across the country where firms have been held responsible for paying defense costs under this duty to defend. Yeah. I just want to know quantitatively. It's hard for me. I don't know the answer to that question. Do you know? I, I apologize. We, I, I, I'm, I am aware of this happening once. I am not familiar with it happening dozens and dozens of times. The issue, though, you'll find, and you can maybe ask this to um, the witness on, on Zoom, is that oftentimes you're just not going to get these small minority-owned businesses to bid because they can't assume that exposure. Okay. Thank you. Delegate Pasteur, and then I think we're going to move on. Okay. I, I think I, under, I understand it, but then you just pointed something else out. So let me ask that first. Are you saying that the owner makes the decision and the owner could say that it is the general contractor who would have that liability as opposed to someone on the design team or the design company as to who is culpable or liable in the event that something happens. 
I'm just in the contract right now. Yes, yeah, so, so the liability ultimately would be determined by adjudication and they, you would go to court and the court system would work itself. Okay, I, I was actually talking as the team uh, for the project was being formed. Who puts it? I thought I was clear until something you just said and then I thought at the inception yep. of the contract, who makes the decision as to uh, which party would be liable if something happened? Just for the duty to defend. Yeah, I think it would. I, I think in practice it will end up in every party's contract. So the the contract with the design profession would include a duty to defend that the owner has inserted into that. The contract that the owner issues to the contracting entity that bids on the project and wins the project, that construction contract would include a duty to defend. Uh, okay. I'm concerned, though, mainly about the small business. So that small, uh, on that design portion, would be held culpable at that point, right? Would have to, and let's just say they managed to take all of their resources to pay that amount up front, and then it's found that they weren't, in fact, culpable, and another company in the project was. So would their recourse be to recoup their money from that other company? Yeah, I mean, there would, there would potentially be a tort claim that could be brought against that other company for damages sustained, but then you get into a question of whether or not the, the entity that caused the fault actually owed a duty to that small business who designed the project. Exactly. Right? And so, that, that's what I was thinking. Then you have a whole new situation there. That's I right. Think. Um, then what would the design company's recourse be if the other company says, too bad? Um, and we're not doing this. Yeah, so for a small firm, it's it's probably either, okay, do we have the resources to pay this, and what's it going to take to get through this this storm or bankruptcy? So if they manage to survive the first part, they probably won't survive the second part. Yeah, and the, and the thing that's challenging for the small business, I, I think I understand your original question, is who sets the terms and conditions. Exactly. Yeah. The, the owner is typically hiring a prime contractor, a larger engineering firm, who's agreed to these terms, maybe because they've made a calculated decision to accept that risk, and then you have a small business who's added to the team, well, that small business doesn't have bargaining power to renegotiate the terms that have been, uh, that have been agreed to upstream. So it's flowed down, and then they have to agree either to because accept that. Because they were that. just happy to be able to get the contract. That's right. And they really have no say at the table. That's right. So one more bite to dust. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I'm going to ask one more question. So the general contractor then could get a duty to defend clause included in their contract with the owner, correct? They, they typically would have the same type of clause. And then they'll be sitting at that table next? I don't think so for the reason that I said that that is they have an insurance product that actually affords coverage for contractual duties to defend. In other words, they would a general contractor in practice would typically name the owner as an additional insured under its insurance policy. Therefore, the owner now sits in the same position that the contractor has where if there's a claim made against it for something that the, that the contractor is alleged to have done wrong, then they tender that claim to the insurance carrier of the contractor who then has a duty to defend the owner just as much as they have a duty to defend the contractor. I, I would tend to politely disagree. I think that they probably would end up at that table, and I think that insurance companies, if they find a way to make money, will absolutely offer a product for, for companies to take advantage of. So the question, I guess, is do they, why don't they see that there's a possibility that they could be making money off contracts that would cover design companies or a duty to defend? I'm not going to say isn't that so because the next bill's here, and I'm going to stop. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 259. Or no, I'm sorry. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 256. We're now going to go to House Bill 259 because the chair of Ways and Means nearly had a heart attack. But I can't nearly cancel that. And we're going to hear from her initial panel, which includes the chair of Ways and Means, Tanya Sharch, and uh, Melissa Ladd and Samuel Levy. Thank you. We Mr. usually take the bill's sponsor. If, uh, okay. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I believe uh, Tanya Shart and Sam Levy will be joining us 
virtually. Good evening, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Good to see you all again. I will see you several times uh, during this session. I'm going to be brief because I'm going to leave uh, all of the points up to the experts. But what I simply want to say is that the goal of this bill is to hold the firearm industry for uh, negligent and reckless actions, um, which do contribute to the gun violence and epidemic that we have going on here um, in the state of Maryland. New York has passed, recently passed, similar legislation. Um, and if you are not all aware, in 2005, I believe it was, the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act, or PLACA, was passed by the federal government, which prohibits manufacturers uh, of guns, gun manufacturers, for being held civil, civilly liable um, in instances where we hold tobacco folks liable, we hold automobile industry liable, um, and so the state of Maryland should also hold gun manufacturers liable for acts in which they are negligent. Um, and so I will leave it with that. Uh, Delegate Rosenberg is here, and he can use the rest of my uh, one minute should he choose, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your indulgence. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, there are two, I think, clear but vital questions for the committee to answer, and I appreciate this uh, extension letting me, allowing me to speak. One, should the manufacturers of guns be held liable in the state of Maryland, as they are in addition to what the sponsor said in New York, they are in the state of Connecticut, because you're aware that the parents there were brought a successful action against the relevant uh, gun, the liable gun manufacturer for the death of their children and for the teachers uh, there, Sandy Hook. Uh, so one, should as a matter of Maryland law we hold gun manufacturers liable? Number two, is this bill, does this bill conform with the federal law, which this sponsor, Delegate Atterbury, pointed out, the federal law explicitly provides for state actions, state tort actions, liability actions. And uh, there is an AG's letter, which I can share about what the standard for any such law in Maryland. I don't know if this bill specifically has been tested against that, but I will share with, with the committee uh, the letter I got uh, on this issue earlier in the fall. So thank you very much. So now, I'll get to you in a moment. We're going to the to the panel. So we'll go to Tanya Shart first, and then Melissa Ladd, Samuel Levy, and okay, and we'll do those three. Uh, or no, I'm sorry, I've got it. I've got this wrong. Tanya Shart and just Tanya Shart and Samuel Levy. So let's hear from Ms. Shart, and then Samuel Levy. Thank you so much, Chair and distinguished members of the House Judiciary Committee. My name is Tanya Shart, and I'm Senior Counsel and Director of State and Federal Policy at Brady. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak on, in support of this bill. In 2005, at the urging of the gun lobby, the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act, or PLACA, was passed and signed into law. Whether or not it was intended to or those who passed it fully understood it, for the most part, PLACA has allowed gun industry actors to avoid civil accountability for misconduct. These protections have often resulted in dismissed cases, cases that drag on for years pending appeal, and have had a chilling effect on cases brought against the gun industry, all too often shutting the courthouse doors to those who have been injured as a result of irresponsible, negligent, or dangerous gun industry conduct that would otherwise be actionable under civil justice principles. Not only is this a barrier to justice for victims, but PLACA has emboldened the gun industry to put profits over people, and we have seen the implications of this in communities all over the state of Maryland. This bill rectifies that injustice by creating a law that would serve as one of the six explicit exceptions to PLACA that permits civil actions to proceed when gun industry members knowingly violated a state or federal statute applicable to the sale and marketing of this product of, of firearms. This bill would establish a state statute explicitly tied to the sale and marketing of firearms. And under this law, gun industry members would be required to establish and enforce reasonable controls to prevent dangerous sales and would be prohibited from creating an unreasonable risk of harm to the public or engaging in other unfair or dangerous business practices. Creating the possibility of civil liability will not only provide civil justice to victims and survivors and entire communities, 
but will also incentivize gun industry members to engage in reasonable and safe business practices, which will prevent gun violence before it happens and curb the flow of crime guns into communities disproportionately impacted by trafficked firearms. I want to be clear, this bill does not create strict liability or guarantee a favorable judgment and will not allow frivolous lawsuits to proceed. Rather, it will ensure that the gun is treated, and subject, is treated like and subject to the same measures and mechanisms of accountability as every other industry in the country because no industry should be above the law. I urge your support. Thank you so much. We hear from Sam Levy, then we're going to take questions and then go to a second panel. Sam Levy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, Vice Chair Moon, uh, Madam Chairwoman, thank you for having me. My name is Samuel Levy. I'm the Regional Legal Director here at Everytown for Gun Safety, and I'm here to urge a favorable report on House Bill 259. As you heard from Ms. Shart, um, the problem essentially is an industry that makes $9 billion in profits annually, while 40,000 40, Americans or more and more than twice that are shot, killed, and injured by their products, and yield costs of more than $500 billion economically for communities like Baltimore and states like Maryland and all over the country. And an industry that, because of the protections afforded to them by PLACA, has had no incentive to innovate, no incentive to act responsibly in the way it markets its weapons, no incentive to create weapons that are less lethal or that can easily prevent things like unintentional shootings, child shootings, technology that's been readily available to the industry for years, but they have continued to flout and refuse to put in place, in part because they face no incentive to do so. When their products are sold irresponsibly, when they're marketed and trafficked to illegal gun sellers and, and diverted into the illegal market, they face no consequence because the PLACA law has created a shield unique uh, among industries like the gun industry whose products are deadly and that cost Americans their lives. Uh, and so what you have before you is a bill that would work through the structure of the PLACA statute and create what's known as a predicate statute, which is a state law applicable to the sale or marketing of firearms that would ensure that when bad actors in the industry, and again, this is not about the industry writ large, there are plenty of responsible gun dealers who care tremendously about how they manage their business, making sure their products aren't lost or stolen, complying with state and federal law. This is about the small number of bad actors within the industry who continue to fuel the illegal gun market and the industry writ large who refuses to uh, take up real responsibility and real, uh, and real solutions for how to make their products safer uh, and prevent the harms they know that they're fueling. And so by passing this statute, you'll create a pathway forward for victims in Maryland who are harmed when, that bad, when those bad actors engage in misconduct, uh, and it will finally create a pathway to accountability that we hope will bring change to an industry that sorely needs it. Urge a favorable report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, we're going to go ahead and take questions now and then uh, go from there. I saw Delegate Kaufman. Are there any other? Uh, Delegate Kaufman, let's go from. Uh, yes, and I apologize for jumping the gun earlier, Mr. Chair. I thought the panel just consisted of Delegate Rosenberg and Chair Atterbury. Um, my question um, for you, Madam Chair or Delegate Rosenberg, is uh, has this. Um, has a statute been has this a similar statute been litigated uh, in other states and has it passed constitutional muster? I believe Delegate Rosenberg mentioned something about Connecticut, but I, I wasn't entirely sure. And let me be very clear that um, that I do support the bill. I'm just curious in this era of a more conservative judiciary whether it's uh, passed muster and if there are other states besides New York that have attempted to pass. Uh, similar legislation, and thank you very much. Mr. Chair, if it's okay, I'm going to ask Mr. Levy to answer that question. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, it's, a, it's a good question. So the law now exists in four states. New York was the first to pass it in 2021. It's since been passed in Delaware, New Jersey, and California. There's similar litigation pending in a number of other states. Um, the, those existing laws have faced challenges. The New York law was challenged first, of course, because it was passed first. Um, there was an attempt to block its enforcement while that lawsuit moved forward. Uh, the motion to, for a preliminary injunction in that case was denied. The judge found the, the law be constitutional sufficiently to let the case proceed and let the law remain in effect. Um, there was a, a reverse finding just the other day in New Jersey where a, a lower court in New Jersey found that, the, that there were issues with the law and issued a preliminary injunction staying the enforcement of that law. We're very confident that that ruling will be overturned on appeal. That case will now go to the Third Circuit. Um, so yes, we are it, it's certainly to face, it's certain to face challenges, but we're very confident that it's going to survive scrutiny. Uh, it, it, it functions entirely within the bounds of the Placa law, um, and we're confident and we're prepared to help Maryland and any other state who passes the law defended from any and all constitutional challenge. So, Mr. Levine, just to make sure I comprehended your statement, it seems like it's still early in the judicial process, and you and I hope that it's found constitutional. 
but there's no definitive answer yet. Thank you. Is, did, did I hear you that correctly? That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further questions for this panel? Delegate Conaway. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, delegates, for coming in with this bill and witnesses. Um, in reference to the purpose of prohibiting certain firearm industry members, is there, do you have a definition for certain, um, Mr. Levy? Is, it, is this that uh, small number of bad actors that you're referring to? Uh, so, the, yes, to your point, the, the language is actually borrowed from the federal statute, and it refers broadly to people who are engaged in the business of firearms, right? That could be a manufacturer or a wholesaler or a retailer. So the definition is meant to include all of those people, but the actual cause of action only is applicable to those who engage in conduct that is in violation of Maryland's law, right? So that is where the cause of action arises. So in this instance, it's a, it's a statute that will create you know, basic standards of conduct to ensure that those who are in the gun industry are behaving responsibly, right, are doing their part to prevent straw purchases, sales that are um, to illegal possessors, sales to those who are likely to harm themselves or others, putting in those reasonable controls and procedures, uh, and broadly avoiding the creation of a nuisance, right, which is a common theory for a whole host of, of, of industries, you know, chemicals, okay. tobacco, what have you. Okay. Um, okay. So only those individuals who fail to abide by that would be, uh, would be subject to lawsuit. Fine. On page two, you have firearm industry member. Uh, is this talking about, in, in uh, page two, line 10, 11, and 12, firearm-related product? Is this including pr the printing of the receivers? Yes, it would include people who sell parts or kits, people who are, are in the business of producing firearms or firearm components. Thank you. Further questions? Seeing none for this panel, thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We're going to hear now you, from, sure, from Melissa Ladd and Catherine Richards and Karen Heron. Who would like to go first? I can go first. All right, Melissa Ladd, go right ahead. Good afternoon, Chairman Kliffinger. Vice Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Melissa Ladd, and I live in District 14. I'm a volunteer with the Maryland chapter of Moms Demand Action. I'm also a teacher and the mother of two. I'm here in support of HB 259 and ask for a favorable report. The gun industry has the information and the tools to innovate, but the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act has eliminated legal incentives for that industry to make firearms safer or to engage in responsible sales practices. After PLACA was enacted between 2006 and 2020, 529,000 Americans have been killed with guns and hundreds of thousands more injured. Yet, many survivors are barred from holding the industry accountable for steps it should have taken to keep our community safe from gun violence. This is the only industry in America that is not held responsible through the court system for damages inflicted upon the public by their product. Thank you so much for your time. All right, Catherine Richards, please. Hello, I am Catherine Richards. I also live in District 14 in Olney. I'm a volunteer with the Montgomery County Group of Moms Demand Action, and I have raised three children in Olney. I'm also here to support House Bill 259. Since 2005, the federal law known as PLACA has shielded gun manufacturers and dealers from most lawsuits and this has created a culture of impunity within that industry. This bill would require gun dealers and manufacturers whose, conduct, whose misconduct violates state's law to face the music. It would require them to put safeguards in place to reduce sales to those who fuel the criminal gun markets, to those who have poor safety practices, or those who are not willing to use basic security measures in dealing, such as the video recording of every gun sale. This bill would also create incentives for dealers to take basic security measures to prevent the theft of guns from their premises. It would open them to lawsuits if Marylanders were harmed as a result of carelessness. Currently, the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives has recommendations for best practices for the gun industry. For example, to keep accurate and up-to-date up inventory of the guns in their possession, or to use certain kinds of locks and bars to protect against burglary but the industry is free to ignore those recommendations and those who are hurt by their lack of action 
have no recourse. Many of the guns lost. Between 2012 and 2021, over 160,000 firearms were reported lost or stolen by gun dealers across the country. And those guns often end up at crime scenes. Furthermore, this bill would give the industry a market financial incentive to design its products more safely. For example, guns could be made with locking devices that have been available for years, similar to the ones on every cell phone, to prevent children from firing those weapons. We can be smarter about how we own guns. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Cliffinger, Vice Chair Moon, and members of the committee. I am Karen Heron, Executive Director of Marylanders to Prevent Gun Violence. I'm here today in support of HB 259 to create a state cause of action permissible under the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act, commonly referred to as PLACA. Civil liability is effectively used in the United States as an important check on the irresponsible and harmful industry behaviors. When legislators have been unwilling or unable to enact laws regulating a dangerous industry, the possibility of civil litigation has helped incentivize industries to take reasonable steps to prevent their products or business practices from causing foreseeable risks to human life and well-being. PLACA, however, has granted the industry unprecedented immunity from this system of justice and accountability. In addition to shielding the gun industry, these legal immunities also provide an unfair business advantage to irresponsible firearm industry members who, over more responsible competitors, who take stronger precautions to protect human life and well-being. House Bill 259 seeks to codify into Maryland law a firearm industry standard of conduct under what is generally known as the predicate exception, clarifying the obligations and pro prohibitions that are unquestionably and specifically applicable to the sale and marketing of firearms, and to provide redress to victims when the industry fails to uphold that standard. MPGV urges a favorable report. Thank you. Are there questions for this panel? Seeing none, thank you all very much. That concludes those people seeking to testify in favor. We'll now hear from the people testifying in opposition, including, I believe, two people who are on uh, virtually. Let me just make sure. Well, yeah, I think we can get everybody up at the table. John Jocelyn, Ari Plout, Donna Worthy, John Pika can come to the table, and then we have the two people who are on virtually, and we'll just hear from all of them, and that I think will conclude that panel. All right, so we'll begin, um, we'll begin whatever order, but I, I kind of like going across the table this way, so we can go from Mr. Pika first, and then we'll go from there. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this legislation, uh, my name is John Pika. I'm here on behalf of the National Shooting Sports Foundation, which is a trade association for recreational and hunting uh, shooting sports. Um, this bill just completely ignores federal preemption. Uh, it's, um, its standards of liability are unreasonably vague. It has conflicting legal standards uh, in, this, in this bill. It subjects law-abiding FFLs uh, to liability without having to prove intent, and it sets a dangerous precedent. Other than that, I still think it's a very bad piece of legislation. Um, if you look at the reasonable controls on pages two and three, how is an FFL supposed to know that somebody's going to commit a crime? And if they do, and they knowingly participate, they are liable. So the proponents of this bill are wrong when they say we're, that FFLs are completely shielded from immunity or they're immune to any liability. If they sell a dangerously defective product, they can be sued. If they participate with someone knowingly selling someone ammunition or a gun and they knew a crime was going to be committed, they're already uh, subject to liability. Um, so if an individual knowingly or recklessly creates or contribu contributes to harm, well, that makes sense, and they're already liable. But even if they are not reckless, they are held to, they're, they're liable irrespective of their intent or uh, any, any intervening act. So if someone commits a crime, whether that person bought the, bill, bought the handgun or the firearm, 
or stole it from someone else, they're subjecting that law-abiding firearms dealer to liability. So, um, in essence, Mr. I ask for an unfavorable report. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, and members of the committee. John Jocelyn speaking in opposition to this bill. It's interesting that the injunction issued by the U.S. District Court in the District of New Jersey was not revealed to you until Delegate Kaufman asked a pointed question. To give you an idea of the scope of this bill and how far it reaches, it has some definitions. Firearm accessory, which is something that's designed to be attached to a firearm. That is then a firearm-related product, and if you deal in that, you are a firearm industry member. So let's talk about some accessories. Plastic muzzle cap to keep dirt out of the barrel when the firearm's not being used. Rubber scope cover protects the lens when you're not using the firearm. A sling. All of these fall within the purview of this bill. Even a gun lock. And you heard that mentioned by the proponents. This is designed to be attached to the firearm and is therefore covered by this bill. This bill then brings in as industry members, anybody who's involved in the manufacturer, sales, distribution. This firearm was part of the National Shooting Sports Child Safe Program. It was given to me by the Baltimore County Police Department. Under this bill, because they are handling this product, it would then place them into the firearm industry membership. It's interesting that the, the bill contains language that has a mens rea for knowingly marketing, but in filing a lawsuit, the, the person filing the lawsuit doesn't have to prove that there was intent. So there's a double standard here. Mens rea, no mens rea. The state of Maryland should not be litigating so that frivolous lawsuits can be brought against lawful, heavily regulated industries, and we ask for an unfavorable report. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, esteemed members of the committee. My name is Ari Plout from Boston Plout Law, here on behalf of the Maryland Licensed Firearms Dealers Association and the NRA in opposition to House Bill 259. This bill is a major concern for us. The bill in its current form would essentially allow the public and or the Attorney General's office to pursue civil actions against a legally operating firearm or guns, gun shop for actions by its customers. An analogy would be if your legislative body sponsored a bill that would deem car dealers liable and would allow for the public to file a suit against these car dealers for actions such as drunk driving, vehicular manslaughter, but also mere nuisances like a loud engine or speeding. This is not the law because it would be an undue burden on dealers because they would be responsible for actions that are out of their control. Why should we put the same, we should, why should we put the same burden on the licensed firearms dealers? We are already a very heavily regulated industry and must comply with federal and state law. We engage in lawful conduct, but some quotes from the bill, unreasonable conduct under the totality of circumstances is far too vague, and deviation, and what, 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 what would be a deviation from reasonable control? <clears throat> public nuisance is a, is a legal term that is essentially something that would interfere with a member of the public's enjoyment. Proximate cause is an element that, that's required to be proved proven in a civil action, but this bill states that the proximate cause would be satisfied if it's reasonably foreseeable effect of the conduct. conduct. This standard is too low and may deem any conduct to be potentially considered as foreseeable. We just don't, we don't believe that this is fair to craft legislation this open-ended. In conclusion, the bill is far too vague, far too low of a standard, and not fair to law-abiding businesses. I ask you for an unfavorable report. Thank you. Hello, my name is Donna Worthy. I'm the president and sole owner of Worth a Shot Firearms and also the president of the Maryland Licensed Firearms Dealer Association. I am testifying today on behalf of both organizations. I'm strongly opposed to House Bill 259. The bill has very vague language, making it impossible for firearm dealers to stay in business due to the liability assumed as written in this bill. Firearm dealers are highly regulated by both the ATF and the Maryland State Police. We go through regular audits with both agencies. Firearm dealers should not be held liable after a legal and lawful purchase took place. It would be impossible to obtain insurance under this bill for us. I personally spoke to multiple insurance companies about obtaining coverage under the bill's guidelines and was informed that they would not be willing to provide coverage under these terms. 
They stated they could not insure us for a possible lawsuit after we complied fully with the law and done everything legally at the time of purchase. Not being able to obtain insurance would force firearm dealers out of business. We do believe in holding dealers liable for criminal acts when they have not done everything in accordance with the law. We are in favor of stronger penalties for criminals who commit illegal acts with firearms, but not stronger penalties for law-abiding gun dealers who are following all laws in place trying to support their families. While this bill may be intended for the bad apples, so to speak, it truthfully affects us all, even those doing everything in accordance to the law. We currently abide by every law in place, and in fact, I do more than is ever required by those mandates. But under this bill, we would it would still not be enough. As a retired Baltimore City police officer who was injured in the line of duty, I am fully aware of the issues with firearms illegally on the streets. But I don't believe gun, do gun store owners and dealers who do everything correctly by the law are those at fault. I strongly urge an unfavorable report for this bill. Ms. Novotny, please. For two minutes, she's appearing virtually. Go ahead. All right, good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Katie Novotny. I'm the Vice President and Treasurer of Maryland Child Issue. MSI is an all-volunteer, nonpartisan organization dedicated to the preservation and advancement of gun owners' rights in Maryland. We are a 501c4 nonprofit. We oppose HB 259, known as the Gun Industry Accountability Act of 2023. I direct you to our extensive written testimony, which points out all of the legal issues with this proposed legislation in detail. There are two particularly egregious problems. So this bill is unconstitutionally vague. Article 24 of the Maryland Declaration of Rights prohibits the enactment or enforcement of vague legislation. Specific details on this are laid out in our written testimony, which again, I encourage you all to read. This bill is also contrary to PLACA, as enacted by Congress, PLACA expressly provides that a qualified civil liability action may not be brought in any federal or state court. Qualified Liability Act is defined by PLACA to mean a civil action or proceeding or an administrative proceeding brought by any person against a manufacturer or seller of a qualified product or a trade association for damages, punitive damages, injunctive or declaratory relief abatement, restitution, fines or penalties, or other relief resulting from the criminal or unlawful misuse of a qualified product by the person or a third party. So Congress enacted PLACA upon finding that the manufacturers of firearms are not and should not be liable for the harm caused by those who criminally or unlawfully misuse firearms or their products. That function as designed and intended. So again, please refer to our written testimony for an in-depth analysis of this as well. And as stated earlier, New Jersey uh, has done a preliminary injunction against this bill uh, that is virtually identical, and we request an unfavorable report. You can't hear me then. Mr. Schneider. My name is Mark Schneider with Atlanta Guns and Vice President of the Maryland Licensed Firearms Dealers Association. I oppose HB 259 as it threatens our ability to stay in business. There are many problems with this bill. Data does not support the claim that Maryland licensed firearms dealers are the source of the reckless illegal actions of criminals. We are a highly regulated industry abiding by both federal and state statutes governing the sale of our products. No licensed dealer knowingly sells to the criminal market as federal and state law already prohibits this with severe civil and criminal penalties. Vague terms such as reasonable controls or unreasonable under the totality of the circumstances are not defined and thus unacceptable. There needs to be clarification on what it means, what it's meant by reckless or unlawful marketing. And the idea that a party does not need to provide proof that a firearm industry member acted with the intent to violate this bill is frankly absurd. This bill would openly open every licensed dealer to frivolous punitive litigation and if enacted into law would make it impossible to obtain insurance. Without insurance, no dealer could stay in business. Dealers should not be held liable for the legal and lawful sale of firearms. Those who commit illegal acts with firearms should. And we support stricter penalties for those who illegally use firearms. I request an unfavorable report. 
Okay, are there questions for this panel? Seeing none, we thank you all very much, and that concludes the testimony on House Bill 259. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Just like that. Um, we're going to go now to Delegate Williams in House Bill 156. Uh, we'll hear from, let's see, how are we doing? Uh, there are four people for... Three people, there we go. Kim Haven, uh, Ronald Cherishow, Natasha Calfani, who are here uh, in person, Nicole Hansen Mundell, who I think is also here in person, may have been signed up another way, so but come on up to the table, please. It's Kiana Johnson, uh, virtually. She's virtual. Not, Not there. there. Okay. All right, well, we're going to hear from this panel then, and then we'll hear from the panel in opposition, and we will go from there. Okay. Delegate Williams, please. All right. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Cliffinger, Vice Chair Moon, and the members of the best committee in the House of Delegates, the Judiciary Committee. <laughs> I'm Delegate Nicole Williams of District 22, testifying in favor of House Bill 156, also known as the Court's Jury Ser Service Disqualification. This legislation extends to um, the civil duty of participation in a jury to individuals with prior convictions that exceed a year. This would mean that regardless of your criminal charges, formerly incarcerated individuals will be able to participate in our Maryland legal system. And according to the Maryland courts, our jury service laws uh, state that if an individual has been convicted of a crime punishable by more than one year, they are currently disqualified to serve on a jury. If they were sentenced to more than one year and have not been pardoned or have criminal charges, charges pending for a crime that's punishable by more than one year, that individual is also automatically disqualified from serving on a jury. Within these situations, the status of an individual's current criminal charges and criminal history does not and should not determine their ability to serve on a jury for the rest of their lives. Furthermore, individuals' experience with the legal system should not be the sole compass of their experiences um, that make up simply because they have a criminal record. They should be able to practice their civil duties and as a result, learn more about the judicial system. Um, here in Maryland, unfortunately, we have a figure where um, roughly the African-American population of our individuals who are incarcerated make up roughly 71% of our incarcerated population. Um, this statistic provided by the U.S. Department of Justice demonstrates that black individuals are more likely to get convicted at higher rates than any other demographic in Maryland. And that also means that black people are disproportionately affected by the current jury service law more than any other group. By the passage of this bill, that would, this would allow our juries to become more diverse, um, to reflect the society in which we currently live, including those who were previously incarcerated, um, the majority of whom are persons in color, of color, and like I said, would increase the diversity of our jury pool. Um, and so you will hear from other um, esteemed individuals that will speak further about why this bill is so important. But for these reasons, I urge this committee to give a favorable report to House Bill 156. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ron Chair Show, uh, good, good afternoon, Madam Chair uh, and members of the committee. My name um, is Ronald Chair Show. I am a former circuit court judge in Anne Arundel County. I went back into law, private law practice in 2011. Uh, I'm testifying today on behalf of the Maryland Association for Justice and asking for a favorable report on this bill. This bill is about fundamental fairness for trial. Uh, this applies to both civil cases and criminal cases and brings uh, Maryland into compliance with the Duren case, Supreme Court case out of 1979, which said juries are supposed to be composed of community members who will fairly judge the, uh, the case based upon community standards. And so that includes people who have been uh, who have been convicted and served their sentence and are now members of society. Uh, this was also approved in the Lovell case, a 1997 case uh, by the uh, Maryland Court of Appeals, now our Supreme Court. 
Um, and there, then they endorse the same principle that the juries are supposed to be composed of people from the community, uh, as, as stated in the Duran case. Um, there's a, in our position paper that I've submitted, I cite the study from 2003 from a man by the name of Colt, which shows that over 6% of the adult population is, is actually uh, precluded from serving in juries because of laws like this. But about 30% of black men are excluded from serving on juries because of laws of exclusion. Uh, everyone who's paid their debt to society ought to be uh, permitted to serve on a jury uh, based upon all these principles involved, and we request a favorable report on this bill. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Kimberly Haven. Um, I'm actually here on behalf of myself and the tens of thousands of Marylanders like myself who are permanently excluded from serving on a jury because we've had a felony conviction. And I'm here, I did submit written testimony that had all facts and da-da-da in there, but I'm here to ask a simple question. Why? Why am I disqualified simply because I had an involvement with the criminal justice system? There's no rationale. There's no reason. I can vote. And in fact, I voted for some folks in this room. I can run for office. In fact, next General Assembly, I could be sitting among you. You don't want me to, but I could. So if I can represent my community, if I can represent my state, why do you think that I cannot be trusted to serve on a jury? There's been absolutely no research ever done that says that disqualifying people with felony convictions will somehow make our justice system less fair. In fact, quite the opposite. The presumption of disqualification lies solely in bias. That there is somehow a fear that individuals who've had an involvement with the criminal justice system will go in favor of the defendant or will have a bias against the prosecution. And that is blatantly untrue. In fact, research has shown that people with felony convictions tend to be more thoughtful, more deliberate in their deliberations. I don't know why this law continues to be on their books. I've, my prison is in my background. I vote, I pay taxes, I do all the right things. I come down here every year advocating for different bills. My right to serve on a jury is also my civic responsibility. It is the one collateral consequence that continues to hang over my head. I urge a favorable report on HB 156. Good afternoon, my name is Natasha Calfany. I am um, the Assistant Director of um, Government Relations for the Office of the Public Defender, and I could not have said it better than my colleague. We are asking for a favorable, favorable report, and I would just testify as to me too. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and um, Vice Chair and Committee uh, members. Um, Mr. Chair, I wanted to let you know, too, uh, you asked about Kiana Johnson. She is on the screen. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Nicole Hanson Mundell, Executive Director of Out for Justice, a grassroots organization that is led by formerly and currently incarcerated people, specifically those individuals who are interested in reforming our lives and um, being our best selves. Um, and taking care of our families um, and being responsible in our community. And like my colleague said, why do I not deserve the right uh, to sit on a jury? Am I not responsible enough to make um, um, decisions about a case based on the facts, based on what the state rep um, presents and based on what the defense presents? Um, have I not served my time? Have I not shown um, that I have come home from jail and made the best of my circumstance and made the best of my life? Do I not deserve the right to sit on the jury? Um, um, in addition to all of the facts, you know, 
One thing is the end result of really this wide scale exclusion is the Maryland court system that cannot provide defendants with a true jury by peers with similar racial, ethnic background, and social economic statuses. Instead, defendants face a jury that is disproportionately white, higher income, and lacking experience with the systematic issues that lead many individuals to break the law in the first place. Um, and this is cited by a report, Jackson Glitch 2021. Furthermore, Marylanders miss out on the benefits of a more diverse jury pool, which has been shown to deliberate. Can I finish my statement, Mr. Chair? Um, uh, uh, diverse jury pool, which has been shown um, to deliberate longer, consider, like Kim said, a wide array of perspectives, focus on the facts of the case, make fewer factual errors, discuss systematic issues, and confront their own prejudice. Um, by allowing Marylanders to serve as jurors after they have fully served their criminal sentence, um, this legislation really um, fully reintegrates returning citizens into civic life and ensures that all Marylanders have access to a considerate jury of their okay. peers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Are there questions for this panel? All right. Thank you all very much. That concludes the those people testifying in favor. We're now going to hear from Stephen, Steve Kroll in opposition. Mr. Chair, did you get Kiana Johnson? She's in support. She says she's on. She's in the waiting room. Yes. She she says she was in the waiting room. Okay, I'll tell her. Go ahead, Mr. Kroll, for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Good afternoon. Good evening. My name is Stephen Kroll, Executive Director of Maryland State's Attorneys Association and the State's Attorney Coordinator for Maryland, and I've been prosecuting since 1984. If Delegate Williams was here, if she's still here, we do I'm believe. Right here. Okay. I'm right well, I was, you, nice to see you. <laughs> we do believe in reintegration, and let me explain to you the reasons why. For everything that everybody said all together, however, there must be balance in every bill, and the balance is simply this: if you've been convicted of perjury, perjury. You should not sit on a jury. If you've been convicted of first degree murder or first degree rape, you should not sit on a jury. For those serious crimes, you should not sit on a jury. For those of the people who have testified, I agree they should be reintegrated. I'm agreeing to that. But for those serious crimes, there must be carve outs made. And the carve outs start with perjury, first degree murder, and first degree rape, because those are such serious crimes, you forfeit your right to sit on a jury at that point in time. Now, people have said, why not use preemptory strikes under Maryland Rule 4 313? For 20 years or more of a sentence, the state gets less strikes. We get half the strikes that the defense gets. So, for those reasons, we're asking for an unfavorable report as to House Bill 156. But again, we do favor reintegration. I told Delegate Williams that when I spoke to her. But there must be balance in any bill. And the balance is the serious crimes, you forfeit your right. And we stand put on that and firm, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Your questions for Mr. Kroll. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Kroll, very much. That concludes the testimony for House Bill 156. We'll go now to the Vice Chair in House Bill 162. Uh, and we will find the folder and talk a little while to give him a chance to get to the front of the room. And we'll ask Karen Heron to come to the table, please. And we're going to hear from Delegate Moon, the Vice Chair, for three minutes, then uh, Ms. Heron for two minutes, and we have one person testifying in opposition. So with this, uh, Delegate Moon, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, colleagues. House Bill 162. Um, is flat out a suicide prevention bill, though it, it's uh, about the topic of guns. I would say it's really near the, neither here nor there on where you are on the Second Amendment. Again, this is a suicide prevention bill. Um, the concept is simple. It basically creates a de facto waiting period voluntarily for someone who is at risk at suicide um, and wants to voluntarily place themselves on a do not sell me list. We have uh, parallels of this concept. This is already done in Virginia, Utah, and Washington. 
It's fairly new um, as of the last couple years. And in Maryland, you might recognize this concept tangentially from our um, gambling restriction list. The casinos uh, maintain a policy where someone who is a problem gambler can put themselves on a list and be denied entry into a casino. And likewise, after a recent passage of the red flag law, we now have a process in Maryland where someone other than yourself can put you on a list um, and have firearms temporarily removed from you. So this is a much smaller step if a third party can do that um, to have you be able to put yourself on this list. So that's the concept in a nutshell. Um, because this is new, I will tell you I've talked to advocates that, have, that, that are in favor of this, that have tweaks like data collection, um, and they want to look at things like how long of a waiting period there should be before you could take yourself off the list. The state police, I think, um, they swapped the letter out, so it's a letter of information at this point. But the way this was originally drafted, it had the state police doing a bunch of work. Um, but earlier today, I spoke to the Department of Health, who already maintains a daily list of people who, by reason of mental distress are, on, are not allowed to have firearms. Um, that list is maintained on a daily basis by the Department of Health and sent over to the state police. And it does sound like we've made some headway this morning um, into being able to simply add to an existing list. So that's where we are today. Um, I would urge some patience with this. It's, uh, like I said, it's a new concept brought to me by um, Senator Edelman across the street, um, but I do think it has merit. It, we're not talking about huge numbers. Maybe a couple people will use this a year, but it sounds like we can fairly simply at the moment um, add this to someone's workload. And with that, I will turn it over. Good evening again. Uh, for the record, I'm Karen Heron, Executive Director of Marylanders to Prevent Gun Violence. I am speaking now in support of HB 162 to establish a voluntary do not sell firearm registry. Every year, around 23,891 people die by gun suicide. About 59% of the gun deaths in the United States are by firearm suicide. In Maryland, our homicides outweigh our suicides, and the rate is 36%. But that's still around 265 deaths per year. That's a gun suicide death every 33 hours. Suicide and suicide attempts cost Maryland $3.8 billion a year, or about 260, or sorry, $625 per resident. Every study that has examined the issue of firearm access as a risk factor for suicide has found that within the U.S., access to firearms is associated with an increased suicide risk. Guns are simply more lethal than other suicide means. They're quick. They're irreversible. About 85% of attempts with a firearm are fatal, and that's a much higher fatality rate than nearly every other method. Many of the most widely used suicide methods have case fatality rates below 5%. And critically, Nine out of 10 people who attempt suicide and survive will not go on to die by suicide at a later date. So by reducing access to lethal means, it matters, right? This bill is about reducing that access by those who need it the most and who choose to do so. MPGV urges a favorable report on 162. Questions for the panel? Delegate Simmons, Ben Embry. Uh, are there any law enforcement agencies that are supporting this bill, or have y'all had any conversation with them about where they stand? So I think the primary issue with this bill, when we talked to folks about it, was not a problem in concept. There was a real question about who would be made to compile the database and maintain it, essentially who, which agency's job would that be. The bill as drafted contemplated the state police, and I think they had some questions about whether they were the appropriate agency. Um, but as I noted, um, they have switched to a letter of information before today's hearing, and I've now, um, with Senator Hedelman, opened the line with the Department of Health. So I do believe 
we are going to be able to resolve this question about which agency should have this responsibility. And if we do so, I don't want to uh, predict, but I do believe we ought to be able to get this to be a very lightweight addition to an existing program um, that ought not create any new burden for firearms retailers or the state police or local law enforcement, maybe for a couple of people at the Department of Health. Okay, so right now the state police oppose it in its current form? They have a letter of information, but I do, but I want to be fair about why they previously um, had a letter of objection to this. And again, it's a lot of questions about who's going to manage the deba database. The fiscal note, again, if we had to do this from scratch with the state police just building, building everything out, they had estimated this was going to cost a million bucks. But again, after talking to the Department of Health today, there's one person in the Department of Health whose job it is to maintain this list, and it sounded like they ought to be able to handle this. There's, I'm oversimplifying it because there's um, privacy questions and um, database security questions and a lot of other things that we need to do. But on the fundamentals, I do believe we'll be able to uh, walk away with here with some sort of simple pilot schematic. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Delegate Embry. Thank you. I know it's a relatively new concept, but I wondered if you know in states like Virginia that have, uh, have it, how many people have ended up registering so far? That's a good question. Um, and the only thing I'll say about it is this. There was a very robust discussion with some of the folks who work on some of the tangential policies who said, we, you know, some of, I'll, I want to be fair, some of them are like very interested in this. Others said, um, we want to keep an eye on this. It's such a new idea, and Maryland is unlike all the other states. You already have a red flag law. You've got a different context. So in a place that doesn't have a red flag, red flag law, but that has a voluntary law, you just might have different dynamics than how it would be set up here. So the one ask they had for us is that we include data collection in <laughs> in our bill, which apparently might be lacking in some of the other states that did this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Delegate Boucher. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Delegate Moon. Are you aware that in a state police report they said there is an issue of proving that the applicant completing the application for the registry is who they say they are, and that it also prohibits a person from obtaining a firearm once they are on the list? That, well, the Part one of that I don't think is too much of an issue. We have lots of government forms and entry points where, you know, you're asked to authenticate your identity. I mean, we actually just had earlier today people doing wills and trusts that wanted us to do that over the Internet. Um, so I think uh, identity authentication um, we can handle. And sorry, your second question was? Once you're on the list, you're prohibited. So I think the, the yeah, that's That's a legitimate question. So look. You're in a bad state of mind. You have a suicidal ideation. You put yourself on the list. The whole point of the list is that you're not going to be able to just change your mind five seconds later and, uh, and buy a firearm because there was some reason you had to be concerned. So that's the, where the waiting period, you've, you're, put, you're creating a waiting period for yourself to purchase a firearm. You can take yourself off that list, but that's going to be in question. And so we have to set a number. In Virginia, I think they said it's three weeks. Um, I don't know what um, Washington and, and Utah did. Um, we, some have suggested if you talk to medical health professionals, three weeks might be too short. Again, that's why I say we'll, we'll have to put some detail on this, but that's going to be a real question. Now, if someone changes their mind and says, man, there's a sweet sale on this new um, firearm, Okay, that's, that is an unfortunate situation, but that's precisely what the bill is designed to, to stop. I suppose they could go into court and sue um, to have themselves off the list mm -hmm. in an expedited manner. Um, that would cert I, I think you'd still have some intended effect from the law based on how much time it would take for that to process. But again, we have to accept that there would be a conflict if someone changes their mind and wants to right, turn around in that, that window. If I may, I, the gist, I think, what the state police are trying to say here, since those two lines are back-to-back, -back, is there's a fear of someone 
putting someone on a list and they're not actually that person. That, that was a concern in other states that looked, I think Virginia had a pretty um, big discussion about this. So I will just tell you, Senator Hedelman, um, and I, I didn't have a, a hand in this, put in this bill a penalty for someone who okay. improperly put someone on the list. It's a criminal offense in, in this text. I probably wouldn't have written it that way based on how I, I do things, but that's, that's what's in the bill. Thank you very much, Delegate. Further questions for the panel? Seeing that, oh, I'm sorry, Delegate Valentine missed you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I do have one question regarding databases, and it kind of wraps around to um, Delegate Boucher. Um, I voluntarily put myself on a list, and I'm in a certain state of mind, and then I remove myself from that list, but we all know databases seem to be forever. And my concern is 5, 10, 12 years down the road, that that notation may be in a database and a trooper is doing a, a background on me. Um, and for some reason, I would be disapproved. And I'm trying to think what would be the safeguard that I wouldn't be disapproved simply for being on there many, many years earlier. And I don't know how we would, how we would um, solve that problem. So that would be my question. Yeah, that's a good question, too. Um... I would say uh, it's been contemplated in the other states also that looked at this. The bill as written contemplates privacy protections. I guess we would have to take a, a harder look at whether they're adequate, um, but this certainly wasn't intended to be an MPIA, an MPIA situation where you could query this database. And again, if you actually look at um, Virginia, say, I think the, the form, there's not it's not like a, a form with tons of information. There's, you just need enough that it, there's unique identifying information so that we can verify um, who it is is on the list. But it's not a huge trove of things that are being asked for people who are applying um, for this right. There's a second question about whether the data itself was properly firewalled in some way um, from hacking concerns. But again, I'd like to think, based on the conversations with um, the folks that deal with a database that already exists um, that has these similar functions. It didn't sound like this was too different from some, you know, there are two or three processes that are already in place to create lists of people um, that are temporarily um, or permanently prohibited from processing firearms. And if I could add yes. just one, not to overstate my knowledge on this, but I think this came up at some of the hearings recently. Um, the health department list, and especially if you go that direction, I believe those are sort of red light, green light lists. They're not detailed um, lists. So they wouldn't be feeding MSP details about you on a, a prior list. They would just have a red light, green light situation as to whether you're appropriate for whatever license you're applying for at that point in time. And just generally, I would say it would, I can't speak for the senator, but it would be my intention that we don't discourage people from exercising um, the opportunity to be on this list by having other collateral consequences or data release down the road that may discourage them from, from using it. So again, if that does end up being a concern, I would want to iron it out. I guess one of my concerns is that it's basically a record forever. So that at one point they put themselves on a list and that never goes away. So then whether it's five or 20 We years could put later, a data deletion policy a, in there. Like a retention yep. period. Like at yep. some point this would finally drop. If no other factors came yep. off. That's what I mean. Yeah, okay. I, I think that makes sense to me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for coming in to testify. So, Delegate Moon, if a person put themselves on this list, they would also be part of the health department's uh, database. Is that right? Well, there's one particular list that gets checked on a daily basis and sent up to MSP, as I understand it. But again, I guess to Delegate Valentine's question, we would have to put some data retention policy into what we do here. Okay. Well, the point I'm trying to get to is, let's say you're on the list and you get yourself off the list, and then 10 years later you go get a hip replacement or something, and you need some high-powered medication, and your doctor's looking and says, well, 10 years ago you were on this list, then they might not want to give you the medication, and the list is 
guarded information because it's medical, so it might not be removed from a from uh, the health care list, but it's removed from the general public's list. I, I think that's just as to which agency would manage the database, but it ought not to be linked to your individual health record, if that makes sense. Well, you were saying something about it was possible that your health care advisor might not well, we have we haven't put in the bill a deletion yet. It, it sounds to me like we would want to do that. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. At the risk of writing the bill presently, let's go to Delegate Simmons. <laughs> uh, just kind of uh, continue what you're talking about. So similar scenario, uh, multiple people randomly check themselves in the hospitals under mental health holes, 72-hour holes. A lot of that's dealing with medications. Uh, but they're still reflected as suicidal or homicidal uh, based on uh, their admittance at the hospital. How would this affect that? Or would it be, still be something you would look to exclude or drop from their record? Yeah, I mean, there's a whole separate process of people who, for medical reasons, are involuntarily denied firearm access. And I believe that process also includes confiscation. Okay. So, again, this is a very – this is a much more stripped-down thing that we're contemplating that is really voluntary. Okay. Any further questions? Delegate Tomlinson. Thank you. Um, yeah. uh, I, I know you mentioned, and I'm just looking at the, uh, I think you mentioned either the casino or the lottery voluntary uh, exclusion list. Do, do, you, do you know or have any data on on how much uh, success they've had with that, by any chance? That's a good question. I have no idea. It's a question for our friends over in Ways and Means. Gotcha. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I, and I expect that database is going to operate a lot differently um, than what we're dealing with here. Okay. I was just I, – I didn't know, I mean, how many people – Yeah, I have no idea how successful it is, but I, but I will say I'm glad it exists. I, I know some problem gamblers. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Sense a subcommittee in our future. <laughs> any any further questions for this panel? Seeing none, thank you very much. We'll now hear from Mr. Jocelyn, who's here in opposition to the legislature. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, and members of the committee. John Jocelyn speaking in opposition to House Bill 162 as it's currently drafted. Delegate Valentine, thank you so much for bringing up one of my primary points. Our concerns are that the provisions of the bill allow you to put your name on, as it's written, a state police list. They have five days to put you on. The bill provision is in 9903. In 5-904, it states that they no sooner than 21 days can remove your name from the list. No sooner than. There is no end date. So if they fail to remove your name, refuse to re re remove your name, you have no real recourse because they're still in compliance because the clock is running forever. 5-905 contains reference to discrimination against a person who was on the list or previously on the list. The question is, how would they know? There's nothing that says someone can't put in a PIA to find out. This seems to imply that they could, because otherwise you wouldn't need to know whether or not someone was on the list or not on the list. And if they were past list, it means the list never went away. Dealers do not have access to this list. Only regulated firearms go through the Maryland State Police. So for long guns, rifles, and shotguns, they go through NICs, and they do not interface with this database. So the dealer has no way to determine whether or not you are, are not, or were on the list at any given time. This is a nightmare for them logistically. Our concerns were for privacy, as the delegate mentioned, suicidal conditions. There are HIPAA concerns there. I'm sure it concerned the Maryland State Police, which is probably why they were you know, not willing to get directly involved in it. We do understand that. All in all, I understand the concept. I'm not directly opposed to it, but I have some serious privacy concerns, and I think the bill as currently drafted isn't ready for prime time. Thank you. Questions for the panel? Okay. 
Seeing none, thank you very much. That concludes the testimony for House Bill 162. We'll go now to House Bill 207. And again, it's the Vice Chair. We've got a couple panels here, it looks like. And one person testifying in opposition. Uh, so in favor, we're going to go with Emily Malarkey, Andrew M M Mazan, Mazan, Greg Hopper. That'll be the first panel along with the Vice Chair. On the second panel, we'll hear from Byron Warkin, Candace McLeod, Frank Boston. So with that, let's hear first from the Vice Chair for three minutes and then two minutes for everybody else. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, House Bill 207 uh, is a consumer safety bill, primarily. Uh, and what it does is it clarifies that a commercial recreational facility, this is like a for-profit gym or a swimming pool, uh, that, that forces its customers to sign something saying, you can hold us responsible no matter what happens, including our own negligence, um, that this would be invalid as a matter of public policy. So as a uh, point of context, we already do this in Maryland for a number of things. Um, you can't make someone sign a construction agreement, a motor carrier agreement, architectural engineering, um, certain landlord uh, uh, interactions where you're simply saying, oh, we're just not responsible for anything we do, including our, our total negligence in maintaining dangerous equipment that we're um, letting you use for profit. So we already do that. This would simply add recreational, uh, commercial recreational facilities into this mix. This was done in New York. Um, so that's sort of the model for it. And I have a uh, few practitioners here who can explain a little bit more about some of the cases that arise from this. Um, and again, I just want to also say uh, there ought to be this is a scenario where there ought to be insurance that comes into play uh, to help people. And so we're not just talking about stranding some small business owner with a sudden new cost and exposure um, to liability. But again, it's just sort of ridiculous. You have people operating heavy machinery uh, and that has a high risk of causing injury and not creating a system that incentivizes them to properly maintain it. So that's the bill in a nutshell. Um, good afternoon. I've said good afternoon. It's good evening now. Thank you for <laughs> sticking around this long. I'm Emily Malarkey. I'm here on behalf of the Maryland Association for Justice. I'm its current president. I'm sure everyone is familiar with the kind of waivers we're talking about that Delegate Moon has just described. If you've ever taken a child, a grandchild, a niece, or a nephew uh, to a birthday party, you know what we're talking about. They're required to participate in almost anything fun in our state. Um, and under existing law, they are enforceable not just for the inherent risks of jumping on the trampoline, but also, as Delegate Moon just said, if the owner or operator of the trampoline park or his employees are negligent and you're injured because there was machinery or equipment that hadn't been repaired or the facility was not staffed appropriately. Um, so waivers harm consumers because there is an imbalance of knowledge. You have an owner or an operator who has all of the knowledge about how the equipment is maintained, where it was purchased, how it's staffed, and what the safety standards are supposed to be. And you have consumers that only have their basic knowledge about what the actual activity they're getting involved in entails from their lay point of view. Um, this does not incentivize the owners to be safe at all. In fact, it incentivizes them to be unsafe because they can get away with it by requiring the participant to sign a waiver. So HB 207 will protect consumers and hold commercial recreational facilities to the same standards of reasonable care that apply to all other businesses and professionals in our state by declaring waivers to be void against public policy. And as Delegate Moon has said, um, we have similar examples in Maryland. There are similar statutes on the books in New York and Virginia, of uh, New York and Louisiana, and it's a matter of common law in many, many other states including Virginia. Um, all other defenses that would be available in a regular civil suit are still available. Contributory negligence, assumption of the risk. So we're asking you to con protect consumers and hold commercial recreational facilities to the same standards of safety that apply to other businesses. And urge a favorable report on HB 207. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chair, uh, committee. My name is Andrew Mason. I'm here on behalf of the Maryland Association for Justice. 
we're asking for a favorable report on House Bill 207. Um, there's been a lot of talk about numbers today, numbers about data with every single bill that's come up here. Uh, a specific number that I want to bring to your attention is 1.3 Maryland kids a day are getting injured in a trampoline park. 1.3 a day. Now, where we got that data, there's a 10-year study from the Consumer Products Protection Division. 240,000 kids over the last 10 years, 2008 to 2019, were injured in trampoline parks. Maryland's actuarial value, a little less than 2% of the country. That's where we get 4,800 kids in the last 10 years. 480 kids a year have been injured in trampoline parks. And like my colleague has said, we're not here to get rid of these. We're not here to get rid of accidents. Accidents happen. But what shouldn't happen and what shouldn't go without consequences is when a business or a corporation is negligent and causes an injury to a child or adult. Now, in that 1.3 kids a day, 59% of those injuries, as reported to the ERs, are fractures. The 59% fracture rate per kid. And I have the data if anybody would like to see these studies. Um, orthopedic surgeons around the country compare what happens with the double balances when you have two people on trampolines at the same time. It's, a, it's akin to the force from a 90 mile an hour car crash. 90 mile an hour head on car crash. We'd like the chance to, to reduce this amount of injury. How many kids can we protect with this legislation? We don't know. We don't know if it's going to decrease the number by 10%, 20%, 30%. We don't know. However, uh, we are urging a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good after or good evening. Uh, my name is Greg Hopper, and I'm a member of the uh, Maryland Association for Justice. I'm also one of its uh, pro one of its chairs of one of its sections. Uh, we're here today because a child who suffers life-altering, even catastrophic injury due to clear negligence can be denied access to justice in Maryland if a guardian or parent signed a waiver form. Here's an example from a client I represent. He's a nine-year-old boy. He suffered a catastrophic brain injury after being partially ejected from a coaster at a recreational facility. He would have been fully ejected, but his mother grabbed his legs as he was leaving the cart. Um, he repeatedly struck his head on the cart and on supports for uh, the coaster as he was going down until the cart could be stopped, leaving him with lifelong deficits. His mother signed a waiver form earlier that day. She was standing in line with her son. He was excited to ride the ride. The release was a virtual word salad. There were clause after clause, page after page. The mother didn't understand the release or how far it went. She's not a lawyer. She's not familiar with the Maryland, the way we have rules of construction. Um, and so to the extent, in my experience, that people in these situations think about waivers at all, they think about obvious risks or common risks. Bruises from slipping on the floor that should have been dry, a sore back because an operator let the ride bounce when it was going too long. But people often have no idea. Um, in this case, she had no way of knowing that three people had been ejected in the last three years, no, no way of knowing that one of them had died, no way of knowing that there had been nine incidents in the previous 12 years. When she signed that form, the difference in knowledge was critical because she would have never signed it otherwise. Thank you. Questions for the panel, Delegate Cardin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just real quick, this is, I think, for Emily. Um, sure. So thank you very much for being here. Always appreciate you guys being here. So I'm going to give you uh, two, oh, two quick scenarios. Um, I'm at the Jolly Rogers Museum Park on that real high thing that goes straight <laughs> down, right? Yep. The, 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 the water slide that goes straight down and yep. spins around. Yep. And I send my daughter down. and She gets um, stuck at the top. Well, the first one, let's just say, God forbid, she has a heart attack. The second one, one of the floorboards comes out, and she goes down, 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 and smacks the ground and has a and, mm -hmm. and cracks her head open. Right. So on the first one, you're, this bill would not stop no. them from saying, look, she assumed the risk. Correct. We said you could have a heart attack. Correct. On the, on the second one. That's right. <laughs> it would be this then. 
you would be able to sue them because they did not maintain proper. Sure, you would be able to. I mean, technically, you could sue them in either case, but you're going to lose in case number one because you've assumed the risk that when you do a thrill ride, you may have a cardiac event. Right. In, in your second example, you could sue them. You'd still have to prove that the floor fell out because the operator was negligent. I mean, that's the, the prerequisite, and they would have all liability defenses that are available to defend themselves. Um, but yeah, and, and, and I just, you know, we're talking about for-profit corporations here. I know that some of the opposition has brought up parks, and um, we can totally deal with that because that's not the intent of this bill. It's to deal with companies that make money. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure if this is true for um, the gentleman on the end. I'm sorry I didn't get your name. Um, yes, sir. Greg Hopper. Okay, Mr. Hopper. And I see you have oral testimony. I just couldn't remember. Um, so I, let me just say, Delegate Moon, I really like this bill. Um, I think it's a great bill. So thank you for bringing it forward. Uh, Mr. Hopper, um, correct me if I'm wrong. I totally could be incorrect. But if you sign a waiver under duress and you decide to sue, wouldn't it be – you obviously could still be um, successful I'm um, not. Sure. I'm just wondering because you know, basically, you have to sign, or you could not. In the example you give, under the rest, you sign this form. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to ride. And I think that's some illegal, a little bit in itself. Is that correct? It, uh, it is, and it isn't. The way uh -huh. it's been interpreted by the Maryland Court of Appeals, or the uh, mm -hmm. Supreme Court of Maryland now, okay. um, <laughs> I is, knew what you meant. <laughs> is that? You are free to <laughs> yeah. you are free to go to another recreational facility. So they don't consider that a form of duress. Okay. And so you know they there are certain things like mm -hmm. health care and other things that are public as public policy matters. Mm -hmm. You can't have them. But the fact that in a recreational setting you're standing there and you can either do it or not do it mm -hmm. is not considered duress. Okay. Wow. I thought that would I thought would, thought that would be so that makes this bill even more important um, to, to to pass. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Any further questions for this panel? Seeing Delegate Conway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, panel, for coming in and testifying. And Delegate, to the, to the gentleman that spoke about the trampoline and the, if you have two people or two more people on the trampoline and they crash together, that could be like a 90 mile an hour accident. Correct. Would the trampoline company generally put up a sign that says uh, you increase your chance of being heard if you have multiple people on the trampoline, or how, how does that work? So, so that's where we get into an issue of every single recreational facility that does trampoline, the trampoline park, they're going to advertise, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if you've ever been, but there's a, there's a grid, right? There's a grid of trampolines, yeah. and the rule that's supposed to be enforced is one kid per square. However, what happens is the rules aren't enforced, and you have a minor kid who might not be there, the parent might be over here, they might be there with a birthday party, and you have the facility worker who's not enforcing that rule, and all of a sudden you have a 200-pound adult with a five-year-old when there's no staff there. That's the situation that we're trying to prevent. And, and is, have it, is some there any requirement that they post a, a notice that – uh, two or more people increase the chance of injury or something like that? Yes. I mean, they, they have certainly have safety requirements that are posted. Any increased safety measures is going to be – I mean, there's no federal like, federal regulation at this point. I think Utah has had some state regulations on trampoline parks. Um, but as of now, there's none. But any anything to make these parks safer uh, and to give recourse for, for Maryland citizens um, when there is negligence is, is definitely a stride in the right direction. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I forgot to mention also there's an amendment in <clears throat> your packet. It's just um, a couple technical clarifying bits. Um, and there was a question from uh, the Republican minority leader, Delegate Buckle, um, about the co-sponsor amendment policy for judiciary this year, whether we are allowing co-sponsors or, uh, or not. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> I'll get around to that later. Um, any other questions for the panel? Seeing none, 
Thank you very much. We'll hear from the second panel now, Byron Warnkin, Candace McLeod, Frank Boston. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you very much for your time today and your consideration on this bill. Um, my name is Byron Warnkin. We, I, I'm here on behalf of the Maryland Association for Justice. I'm also here as uh, a parent. Um, and I'll just tell a very brief anecdote. My eight-year-old son last June begged me to have a birthday party at a trampoline park. And I said, Gibson, his name's Gibson. I said, Gibson, I'm a trial lawyer, and, I've, and I, I, I know how dangerous these places are. They're terrifying. And ultimately, he won. <laughs> but, but the way that I did it is I rented out the trampoline park because call after call, because of the, com the content that we have put out on the Internet, we get call after call about trampoline parks. And I know that they are understaffed. I know that the equipment is poorly maintained. I know that they have insufficient uh, equipment for each individual user. I know this because of time and time again hearing this. So I rented it out and I made sure that that was not going to be the case. I made sure that there would be sufficient staffing and that there would be sufficient equipment. How many of our citizens in Maryland can do what I did in that circumstance? Obviously, the answer is not many. And this isn't about bubble wrapping our world. This isn't about taking risk away from risky situations. Situations, as Delegate Cardin pointed out, can be inherently risky. The point is, when the purveyors of these situations are negligent, they need to be held accountable. We need a chance to hold them accountable. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time this evening. My name is Candace McLeod, and on June 20th, 2021, I went to a trampoline park in Glen Burnie for my nephew's eighth birthday. When we arrived at the park, the employee at the front desk informed me that they had run out of adult grip socks, but it was okay for me to jump in my regular socks. After 10 min about 10 minutes later, upon landing from a jump, my sock slipped on the trampoline, causing my left leg to slide right, while the rest of my body continued down, tearing both my ACL and my MCL, two of the four major ligaments in the knee. But it was okay for me to jump in my regular socks. When the ER technician saw my x-ray, he said he wasn't surprised it happened at a trampoline park and that he never lets his kids go to them because he x-rays these types of injuries all the time. But it was okay for me to jump in my regular socks. The trauma to my knee was so severe that that night I had emergency surgery and woke up with these rods screwed into my knee, uh, keeping my leg in place. But apparently it was okay for me to jump in my regular socks. I spent the next month in rehab um, in a trauma unit facility away from my family, rods in place, learning how to use a wheelchair, how to hop to get from point A to point B, and how to bathe and feed myself. But it was okay for me to jump in my regular socks. The next year of my life was spent in multiple surgeries, grueling physical therapy, mental and physical exhaustion, sleeping in a hospital bed in my parents' living room, maneuvering a wheelchair, and learning how to walk and regain my independence. But it was okay for me to jump in my regular socks. Before my injury, we were actually having quite a wonderful time at the trampoline park. But as you now see, it was not only was it not okay for me to jump in my regular socks, it wasn't okay for the employee to tell me that it was. And it is not okay that a waiver that I signed to go to a kid's birthday party has protected the business from having any level of accountability for their negligence. It was not okay for me to jump in my regular socks. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm Frank Boston III. I'm here as a legislative attorney on behalf of the Maryland Association of Justice. And uh, we want to thank our delegate, Vice Chairman Moon, for putting the bill in. Uh, and we support this bill. Before, I, I'm here basically to talk about the clarifying and amendments that conform the House bill with the Senate bill, but I think uh, there's an, another amendment that the committee may want to consider based on 
some of the testimony from the opposition we've seen. We are not here to go after the landlord unless the landlord's negligent. We're not here to go after the landlord. We're here to go after the owner-operator who is the negligent party. Um, so if the bill is not clear in that regard, we welcome an amendment to make sure that that is flushed out. Um, it's the owner-operator uh, who has the faulty equipment that's not taken care of that we are seeking to uh, make the waiver against uh, make the waiver void against public policy. The clarifying amendments. Um, Senator Carter came up with a few amendments that really uh, make the bill better, uh, and uh, Delegate Moon had already uh, submitted his. The first one uh, clarifies the definition of recreational facility um, based on New York law. Basically, it says that pools and gyms are included in the definition. Um, I had a case in a gym. If I have time, I'll tell you about it. Amendment 2 adds the word limit in Section B of the bill. The reason for this amendment is to make it clear that there can be no partial waiver of liability or a limited waiver of liability. You can envision a crafty attorney uh, drafting a, a contract uh, uh, as such. Finally, the Third Amendment removes the word bodily uh, and from Section B. It, it read bodily injury. Uh, if we remove the word bodily, uh, the purpose of the amendment is to show that all injuries are compensable. For example, emotional distress, post-traumatic stress syndrome, property damages, etc. We ask for a favor. Questions for the panel? Delegate Conaway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, witnesses, for coming in and testifying. Uh, Mr. Boston, when you said limited liability, does that mean that a person who gets hurt could possibly have contributory negligence? No, no. If, 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 you're, if you assume the risk or you're contributory negligent, as you know, Maryland has some of the strongest laws in that regard. This doesn't take away that at all. But with, it, with the way the bill would read is, is on page one, it says uh, any provision in the contract or agreement relating to the use of recreational facility that purports to release a recreational facility from, and then we insert or limit, indemnify, or hold harmless. Meaning you can't come up, so if you pass this law, we're saying that um, you can no longer waive liability if you're at fault. And the purpose of adding the word limit is you can't come up with a limited waiver of liability that's, okay, it's not a general waiver, but in some way, shape, or form, um, there's partial liability that, that can be waived. You get it? Yeah. It's making sure that you can't uh, say, okay, we may not be liable for this. I mean, we may, we may not... We may you we you may not be able to waive we may not be able to waive liability for this is what I'm saying, but we can still waive liability for partially for something else. So, okay. I'm trying to think of a good example. I can't. Can you? Yeah. 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 But I I, I can give you an if I may I can give you an example in the case that I had. Uh, the guy goes to the gym and he's working out, okay? To your question, if he overdoes and overexerts, he assumed the risk. Uh, this bill, um, the, the gym is not liable for his, for his overexertion on the, the machine that's working properly. Um, but I had the case where he's, he's lifting and the machine breaks and falls down on him and he gets injured, okay? Um, because he signed a waiver to go into that gym, he can't recover for their negligence on not keeping the machine, uh, you know, uh, in, in proper form. And, and, and that's a good example of what the bill does. So, you know, it doesn't get rid of assumption of risk. It doesn't get rid of, uh, um, uh, um, you know, any of the other affirmative defenses that, that normally come in Maryland. I don't, I don't want to run too long, but I, I have an example if, you, if you'd like. Certainly. So, for instance, in, in Ms. McLeod's situation, the park might say, well, you cannot sue us if we are negligent. And if that is against public policy, a, a partial example would be if we are out of socks or we are out of supplies, 
you can't sue us for that. So that would be a partial example. Further questions for the panel? Seeing none, thank you all very much. I'm going to hear from one, one person testifying in opposition, Shannon Nazal. We'll hear from her for two minutes, please. Good evening, and thank you, Chair Kiplinger, Vice Chair Moon, and committee members. For the record, uh, I'm Shannon Nazal, and I'm here representing the Maryland Association of County Parks and Recreation Administrators, or MACPRA, the Maryland Association of County Park and Recreation Affiliate. Um, MACPRA is in opposition of House Bill 207 as drafted. MACPRA recognizes the importance of responsibility of liability for recreational facilities and amusement attractions. And while the general purpose of House Bill 207 aims to hold commercial recreation facility owners and operators accountable for negligence, MACPRA opposes the legislation as written primarily because of the unintentional impacts on local parks and recreation agencies. The bill language states recreational facility means a commercial recreational facility, a commercial athletic facility, or an amusement attraction. In the foregoing definition, county facilities will be interpreted as commercial by the courts when they are rented or leased. Though the bill is not intended for local government parks and facilities, the courts will interpret the statute as currently written and will look to the purpose at the time of use. County parks and recreation agencies throughout Maryland maintain several agreements with outside organizations at county-owned facilities that include indemnification language that protect counties. This could be with a local swim club, soccer association, fitness class providers, or even medical professionals. Removal or alteration of this language would put counties and their constituencies in a very compromised position. This could result in financial and legal hardships, though a county would have no part in that negligence. It may also reduce the use of public recreational facilities by partners as the liability would be too great. While it is important for owners and operators to not be negligent in their actions, MACPA believes that this legislation should provide specific exclusions for state, county, and municipal parks and facilities. With this, MACPA urges an unfavorable report on House Bill 207 as drafted. Thank you for your time. Questions for the witness, the vice chair. Yeah, press the button. Uh, there we go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just to be perfectly clear on this, if we clear, clarify that the county facilities leasing to a commercial rec operator um, would not be covered, you would not have a problem with the bill? We, we would be able to work with you, um, Vice Chair, on a, a language that, that would work for the Parks and Recreation agencies throughout the state. Got it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Further questions for the panel? Seeing none, thank you very much. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 207. And now the last bill. Last bill. Not ever. House Bill 225, Delegate Charles, Deb Seltzer, uh, Jessica Kinkosa, uh, Vicki Schultz, and Rena Shaw, if you would come on up. Those are the people we have uh, set to testify in favor. Um, we have a panel uh, testifying in opposition here for a moment, but let's begin in here for three minutes with Delegate Charles. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Klumpacher, uh, Vice Chair Moon, and honorable members of the Judiciary Committee. For the record, my name is Delegate Nick Charles, and I am grateful to provide testimony in support of HB 225 foreclosure proceedings, residential mortgages, and grantors' access to counsel. Home ownership is an American dream, but this dream can easily turn into a nightmare, as some of you have heard, when folks are going through financial strain. Foreclosure is a catastrophic event with tremendous ramifications for the future financial stability and social mobility of affected families. As a state, we have the unique opportunity to help communities that have been impacted by these issues to work and ensure they get the help when they need it the most. This bill establishes access to legal representation for individuals meeting specified qualifications and specific foreclosure proceedings. These covered individuals uh, represent 
uh, those who make 50% of the state's median income, and what right now is $94,384 is the median income, 50% of that is $47,192 or less. To facilitate this access, the bill establishes the Access to Counsel and Foreclosure Proceedings ACFP program, which will be administered by the Maryland Legal Services Corporation to organize and direct services to provide individuals with access to quality legal representation. This bill also established an ACFP task force and ACFP special fund, which is to be administered by MLSC. This is a step that we can take forward together to ensure our state is supporting generational wealth development in all communities throughout the state of Maryland. Today we have a brain trust of Maryland Community Legal Services, the Brookings Institute, Ashoka, and others here to testify in support of the measure. Unfortunately, one of our folks, Dr. Stuart Yasker of the Economic Architecture Project, was unable to make it. But I just wanted to drop a couple of stats that he broke down for us. In the third quarter of 2022, the foreclosure rate in Maryland jumped to 10.2 foreclosures per 10,000 households. That's 3.1 points higher than the U.S. rate of 7.1. That means Maryland is among the 10 states with the highest foreclosure rates in the country. Access to counsel during foreclosure proceedings is one of the most effective, cost-effective ways to ensure people's rights are respected and people can remain in their homes. Opponents to this bill will argue that it's costly and unnecessary and untimely, but these arguments are wrong on both accounts. While Maryland has made progress in helping families to avoid losing their homes, there is much more progress that can be done, and that's what this bill is here to do. And I'm going to now turn it over to my panel of esteemed, smart individuals that are leaders in the state. And uh, just for FYI, we do have support from this bill by the Maryland State Bar Association, Midshore Pro Bono, the Attorney General's Office, Pro Bono Resource Center, and others who are here to join us today. And I'll turn it over to my panel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, whoever would like to go first, you have two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. Nice to be with you again. My name is Deb Seltzer. I'm the Executive Director of Maryland Legal Services Corporation. We are a statewide funder created by the Maryland General Assembly in 1982 to do exactly what this bill calls for, to direct funding for civil legal aid for Marylanders in need. With appropriate resources, MLSE is happy to serve as administrator of this project. Along with other projects, we have used restricted one-time funding for a foreclosure prevention project since 2016. In a typical pre-pandemic year, our grantees served uh, about 600 homeowners in representation in foreclosure proceedings. In addition, about 1,500 other homeowners received advice or counseling on steps they could take to prevent their foreclosure. Grantees report now that cases are slowly ticking back up after the pandemic moratoriums. Still, they are hearing some cases right now that were actually filed before the pandemic. They also report that the cases they are seeing now are much more complicated. Grantees use models of staff attorneys, pro bono attorneys, and low bono attorneys to meet the need best in each jurisdiction. Foreclosure is a process with many discrete steps. Our grantees report that some foreclosure cases can take more than 50 hours of attorney time. Having an attorney to explain all options will both ensure homeowners have their rights enforced and help to make the process more efficient. One thing that we have learned from our four decades of funding legal services is that the sooner a client can connect with a counsel, the better. Being able to perform outreach at the notice of intent to foreclose stage will be tremendously helpful. If a homeowner contacts a legal services provider too late in the process, their options can be much more limited. And we all know that one foreclosure is too many. We ask for a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Clippinger, Vice Chair Moon, and the honorable members of this committee. For the opportunity to testify in support of HB 225, a bill that will allow homeowners to receive access to counsel and foreclosure proceedings. I'm Jessica Kinkosa, the Executive Director of Community Legal Services, a nonprofit organization established to provide quality legal services to income eligible residents of Prince George's County. We provide representation to homeowners, and advice to homeowners facing foreclosure in Prince George's County. Since 2008, CLS has been a leading organization in Prince George's County for helping residents avoid foreclosure through advice and representation. During the 2008 foreclosure crisis, the legislature enacted laws to improve foreclosures and allow homeowners meaningful notice of the foreclosure of their homes in hopes that it would improve the foreclosure process, provide homeowners a fair chance to save their homes, 
and preserve homeownership across Maryland. These laws, while helpful, are still not enough to assist all of the homeowners facing the loss of their homes. Post-pandemic homeowners across the state face additional challenges limiting meaningful participation in the current foreclosure process. The challenges under Maryland law include numerous technical pitfalls in the normal judicial process outlined in Maryland Rule 14 that can lead to summary denial of homeowners' arguments, silencing their voices. The technical expertise to be heard is too often dependent on funding an attorney to plead for the homeowner. Homeowners who have had hardships causing them to fall behind on their mortgages not only have to find the funds to bring their mortgages current, but also to, make, um, to find and pay an attorney for the privilege to do so. The irony of foreclosure defense is that the homeowners pay attorneys to be allowed the time to pay their lenders instead of simply paying their lenders. It is undeniable that successful foreclosure defense not only preserves homeownership, but lenders are made whole because successful foreclosure defense means the homeowner continues to pay their mortgage. CLS clients always want their day in court to state their stories. They want to plead their case. We urge a favorable report. Good evening, uh, Chair Clippinger, Chair, Vice Chair Moon, and members of the committee. I'm Vicki Schultz. I'm the Executive Director of Maryland Legal Aid. Maryland Legal Aid is a nonprofit law firm that provides free legal services to the state's low-income and vulnerable residents. From our 12 offices, we serve residents in each of Maryland's 24 jurisdictions. We're here today. We appreciate the invitation from Delegate Charles to testify in support of HB 225 and ask that the committee give it a favorable report. This General Assembly has previously recognized that there's a strong state interest in providing a right to counsel in certain fundamental areas of civil law. By passing the Access to Counsel and Evictions Law in 2021, you recognized that preserving housing stability, ensuring that individuals and families have secure, stable housing is vital and in the state's interest. Further, we know that it's black and brown families and communities that disproportionately face the loss of housing through evictions and that historically, those same communities suffered disproportionate rates of foreclosure. With this bill, the General Assembly would expand the state's interest in promoting housing stability as well as its interest in preserving home ownership and intergenerational wealth by providing access to counsel for families facing foreclosure. The loss of one's house home is a devastating consequence, not only for the family who loses that home, their place to live, and the potential generational wealth that home ownership generates, but the community loss when a home is sold through foreclosure. The loss of wealth is substantial. And what we would say is that uh, Maryland Legal Aid currently represents homeowners facing foreclosure through its legal assistance program. And in our experience, Advocates know that those who seek legal assistance early in the process and have representation have a higher rate of home retention. Early involvement is absolutely critical and having an attorney by your side to investigate the legal claims, the complex legal claims involved in foreclosure is essential. We urge a favorable report on this bill. There you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, good evening, um, Vice Chair Moon and the committee. Uh, I'm Rena Shaw. I'm the Executive Director of the Maryland Access to Justice Commission. Um, I've, obviously, I was uh, before this committee earlier reporting on the Access to Counsel and Evictions Task Force, and our colleague uh, Vicki Schultz has, um, you know, said about the state taking responsibility for housing preservation. And when I look at this issue, foreclosure is just the other side of eviction. If we are serious about preserving people's homes, keeping them housed, and not um, experiencing all the collateral consequences that come with the loss of home ownership, the disparate impact on black and brown communities, this is a bill that um, this, this body should support. Um, the Access to Justice Commission has been a thought leader in promoting and bringing right to counsel in the state. Way back in 2011, we authored one of the first reports on right to counsel that um, advised and suggested that we should expand right to counsel with state funding to areas of human needs. And while we don't have specific a specific study on foreclosure, we do have, we, and we have studied many other areas of law, 
where attorneys make a difference. They are the key contributor in making a difference in the case outcome. Um, we have studies that show when people are uh, represented in public benefits cases. We have studies that show um, people who are represented in debt cases, in immigration cases, um, in protective order cases. Every time the difference between the success with an attorney is fourfold, fivefold. So it does make a difference. And as our colleagues have said, foreclosure is a complex process. And so for anyone to have to navigate that on their own would result in unjust outcomes. And for those reasons, we strongly support um, HB 225 and urge a favorable report. Are there any questions for this panel? I see Delegate Tolles. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Vice Chair. Just to put my teammate in 2-5 on, on a high seat a little bit. <laughs> no, it's going to be a friendly question. Um, uh, welcome to Judiciary at 6 o'clock. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you're hanging out with us. So um, I just have a question. Um, on page 7, it talks about local jurisdictions. So is this enabling legislation for local jurisdictions? It looks like it, it is. Based off line um, line two, yeah. And then the up, so then my other question is, um, how would the funds be collected? Is this a new fee, or is it through already existing tax, like recordation tax? Would you take it from that, or would you impose a new fee? Because it says line thirteen, twenty five dollars on sale of less than two hundred thousand. So you would add twenty five dollars or fifty dollars. So yeah, this is a new fee. And uh, we have a friendly amendment from the comptroller's office. Okay. And so the comptroller, uh, we, we accepted this amendment from mm -hmm. them. And so now it will be collected the same way most fees are collected when you're recording uh, for housing sales. So this will be collected by the clerk of the courts in the local jurisdictions. Okay. So I, as I just told, look, uh, Dean Schultz was one of my deans <laughs> at law school. We were just talking, and Jessica and I, we were just talking. I wholeheartedly believe in access to counsel for civil law, especially in, you know, our communities that we represent in Prince George's County. Um, I have serious concerns about a fee that's a new fee that would be imposed on homeowners. We have so many fees already, like, you know, we got an Uber fee now. <laughs> we have, you know, uh, cell phone fees. We have so many fees. And as a former council member, I always, um, you know, rejected new fees and new taxes on individuals. So there's there's a way to collect already from the recordation tax that people are getting, you know, the people are already paying, like maybe some a small nominal portion from that going to a new fund that can be created. Um, I'm not sure, if, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that can be done from a local jurisdiction um, standpoint since, since it's, it is enabling, but I would definitely encourage that because take a small portion of that toward this new fund. Because number one, it's always going, and you're not imposing a new fee on homeowners. Right, and this fee is specific to sales. When there's a sale taking place, it's a $25 based on homes at the... Right, but that would be a new a right. new fee, so that would be added on. So, okay, if I'm saying they already take the money out, so can they just take some of that instead of adding like a new fee, or like a new line to say... We, we can definitely visit that okay. in a conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Delegate Schmidt. Uh, th thank you, Chair, and, th and thank you for being here, uh, Delegate. Um, I see a $600 fee listed here on page, is that page three? It says, in addition to other filing fees, $600, of which $300 should be distri distributed to the access of counsel and foreclosure proceedings. So would that fee be on the, let's call it bank in this situation? I mean, how does that? That's that's from last year's version of the bill. That's not in this year's. Not in this year's. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sorry, that's the document I have here. And second question is, I see Maryland Bankers Association as an unfavorable report. Any Anything you want to elaborate on there? Have you had a chance to look at that? We, I think we could 
we could certainly talk about that. I think one of the concerns that the Bankers Association had, as I understand it, is about timeliness and that this could elongate the timeline. However, in our experience, uh, having attorneys there actually uh, expedites the process um, and getting attorneys in early uh, really helps move the process along, quite to the contrary of what the bankers might assert. Um, we think that actually that helps quite a bit. I think when lawyers are added at the end of the process, it does elongate the process. But if they're uh, available and involved early, we can get to better streamlined resolutions because lawyers talk to lawyers more easily than homeowners who may not uh, be as apprised about the, the legal documents they're facing. Sure. I understand. Thank you for elaborating on that. Delegate Williams. Okay. Um, going back to the fee, I'm actually, well, anyway, Delegate Tolls knows this is where we kind of differ sometimes. Um, but my question that I have, I'm assuming this fee will, I guess my, this is my question, will the fee that is charged be able to cover you all's cost to implement this 100% or kind of in terms of the operating cost for this program, would that be able to cover it or would you still need extra funds from the state or that, so that's my question. There are a lot of variables obviously at play here, one being the level of home sales, um, the value of homes, that kind of thing. The, the fiscal note projected about $10 million a year that. in income. That would be a significant increase. MLSC currently dedicates about $500,000 a year um, to foreclosure prevention. So um, I believe that it would cover the initial cost at least as we as we ramp up and I think we would have to evaluate again on both on the you know revenue side on how home sales went um, if that fee was in place and then also on the filing side of foreclosures and kind of how the economy continues. Um, I think we were discussing earlier one of the things we found with the last recession is that kind of as the recession was underway the evictions hit first and then the foreclosures lagged right. behind and so that may be something that you know, they're slowly taking up now, but in a year, we, we may have a much more significant problem. Thank you. All right, that looks like the end of questions for this panel. We have one person signed up in opposition, Robert Hinton. Two minutes when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Robert Enton on behalf of the Maryland Bankers Association. And we are opposed to this legislation. There was a similar bill in last year. Uh, we opposed that as well. That bill um, uh, did not pass out of the committee. I, I would, I, let me just say that you have our written testimony, and I would really urge you to take a look, particularly at the exhibits uh, to the, our written testimony. Uh, we have spent, uh, I guess going back to 2008, we have spent years and years working out the foreclosure process. This is, this probably, I don't know, 50, 100 page document I have right here. This is Maryland's current foreclosure law. It is probably the most friendly consumer foreclosure law in the country. And that's why when you look at the data that's attached to our testimony, you will see that for 2022, while there were, um, uh, if you turn to the uh, statistics, uh, Maryland foreclosure statistics, there were um, uh, 50, 50, 18, 38,000 uh, notices of foreclosure. That's the top bar in 2022. Look at the bottom bar. There were 1,195 properties that went to sale. We have 1.1 million mortgages in the state of Maryland. The number of properties that actually go to sale because of all the consumer protections that the legislature put in is one-tenth of one percent. And the reason is that our foreclosure process works. In addition, we are sitting right now, imagine this, on $137 million in foreclosure aid is sitting at the Department of Housing and Community Development. My last comment is, and I'll afford to speaking to you individually when I have more than two minutes to talk. My last comment is that the, um, uh, 
if you look at our, our, our testimony, you will see the notices that go out. You will see how long it takes. You will see that there's mediation supervised by an administrative law judge. And it's because of this process that our foreclosure process works. This bill increases the uh, uh, closing cost for every single person that buys a home in the state of Maryland, and we just don't think it's necessary. We'd urge the committee to give the bill an unfavorable report. And just one, one last comment, if I could, please, because I forgot to mention, and I think it's important. Last year, legal aid's funding went from $20 million, Maryland Legal Services Corporation, to $33 million last year. So there's no shortage of money at Legal Aid to provide this service under today's budget. Thank you for your patience, Mr. Chairman. All right. Any questions? All right, we got one, uh, two questions, Kaufman and then Delegate Williams. Uh, Mr. Uh, and it's good to see you. Good evening. Thank uh, you. Would you acknowledge that um, for your clients there are certain hassles for banks when they foreclose on a property, such as having to mow the lawn, such as having to get the listing agent, such as potentially selling for a loss? Well, let me say this, Delegate, that first of all, there are no surpluses in foreclosures. Uh, you know, uh, the interesting thing about this whole process in the real estate lending, everybody thinks I make a pretty good living down here, and I, I, I have, and I have for many years. I don't deny that. But neither I nor anyone I think on this committee could walk in to a bank and say, loan me $500,000 unsecured. It just doesn't happen. I don't care who you are. You have to put up collateral. And you put up your, you know, if you're going to buy a home, you may put down 20%. The bank puts down 80% typically. Uh, and, that, and that's the reality. And banks can't make loans unless there's collateral. And in the instance where someone can't pay their mortgage, and that's what this is about. It's not about anything else. They can't pay their mortgage. We have a statute that provides for mediation. We have a statute that provides for a loss mitigation affidavit that has to be filed. The, the, we had a task force last year, informal task force, run by the Commissioner of Financial Regulation that had the consumer advocates at the table, it had the lenders at the table, and not one consumer advocate came to that table and said, you know what, these people, we need to set up a fund to have legal representation. What did they do? They said, we need to revise what goes out to the cut to the consumer so that it's consumer friendly and so that they can understand just what their options are. So if you look at our uh, attachment to our testimony, this is what it looks like now. Before it was like a formal legal document. Now it says, mortgage late, don't wait. Contact your servicer. It lists all of the toll-free numbers that people can call to get counseling. Uh, there are eight pages on the, at the end of our testimony that list all the various counseling agencies that are all over the state of Maryland. Uh, our foreclosure process went from being about 90 days to 540 days. We now have the fourth slowest foreclosure process in the entire country because of all the consumer protections we worked in. Brief so. follow-up, Mr. Vice Chair? Well, uh, I appreciate all your efforts of your, um, your clients to help people, um, but I just, I, I just think that um, you're underselling the hassles for your clients when, um, when mortgages are foreclosed. And secondly, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but based on my knowledge of the mortgage industry, when uh, I go to a, uh, the David Moon Bank and I um, get a mortgage for a house, uh, that bank, after they give me the uh, loan, assuming that I qualify, promptly, promptly sent, uh, sell, sells that mortgage and bundles of other mortgages to other entities. So it's quickly sold and not that bank's hassle anymore. So I would say this to you, Delegate, that in most instances, number one, they're sold with recourse. They're sold into the secondary market. They're bought by uh, FHA and the federal agencies uh, that constitute the secondary market. 
but they're sold with recourse to the bank that makes the loan. The banks typically hold on, in many instances, to the servicing of those loans. Once again, I would tell you that we have a process that works, and we just don't see the need for this legislation. We don't see the need for increasing closing costs for Maryland people that buy homes. Um, you know, if, 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 if there was a bill in front of you today that said, well, you know, this is, this is something that, that needs to be changed in the current law uh, to make it more advantageous, you know, we'd be here to talk about that. But that's not what this bill does. This bill just says now, in addition to everything else that legal aid does, we're going to throw another, I don't know, whatever the fiscal note says, um, uh, Another $10 million a year, and it goes to $14.6 million in 2028, that Maryland homeowners are going to donate that money to have legal aid, in addition to what they already have, provide counsel, and we just don't see where it's necessary. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Okay, I didn't press the button. <laughs> um, Good to see you, Ms. Seaton. How are you today? I'm fine. Thank um, you. I know you referred us back to your written testimony, which is very robust here. The one thing, though, I wanted to point out that I saw in your written testimony, you have these stats about Maryland foreclosure statistics and how they right. seem to have gone down the last couple of years. Um, but it's my recollection, because of the pandemic, the courts shut down completely in 2020. And right. we're still shut down in 2021. And just now we're starting to get back up in 2022. But just from my experience, there's a huge backlog of cases that haven't run, foreclosure cases that have not run through the system because of the backlog, because of the court closures. So would that explain for the really abrupt decrease that you're showing here in your charts on pages five of your testimony? Uh, look, uh, uh, Doug, I'm always going to be, be, be forthright with you and honest. And, and sure, you know, I think that's, you know, there's clearly, a, you know, if you look at the statistics from, from, from 2019, uh, you know, we, we were working, there were maybe 7,000 sales. The only thing I would tell you is this, that right now the number is very, very low. Uh, we did change, significantly change the forms that go out to uh, mm -hmm. uh, consumers. And that was a process that the Commissioner of Financial Regulation and the Consumer Advocates came up with. And, you know, I, I deal as a lawyer with legal, and so do you, with legal forms from the courts all the time. I mean, you have a, uh, another bill uh, in here that, you know, that, we, that I testified on that dealt with garnishments. And one of the problems is, and I've raised this with Judge Morrissey, is the forms that go out to the judgment debtor are legal, in legal lease. Mm -hmm. And we've bent over backwards to make the forms that go out to the consumers not legal leads. I mean, if you look at them, people are going to know what they need to do to protect themselves, and these forms have just come out. In addition, the Commissioner of Financial Regulation just promulgated, and they are final now, regulations which require the lender to notify the consumer when the, when the borrower, when the foreclosure process begins, how they can contact uh, the, housing de the housing department to find out about mortgage assistance. And once again, I would tell you, we're sitting on $137 million. So how does a borrower get out of foreclosure? They get the mortgage assessment and they pay it current. Right, but the mortgage assistance program that you're referring to, that's paid from HARPA money and money that we got from the federal government for COVID relief. That money isn't going to be here indefinitely, isn't that correct? Right, but it's going to be there for a while, that's for sure. And once again, I would tell you that, that the last thing that any mortgage lender wants to do is foreclose, ever, ever. And that's why they work with the borrower, and that's why they go in front of an administrative law judge for mediation. And often what happens there is that mediator just doesn't sit there and say, okay, you say what you're going to say, and you say what you're going to say. What that mediator does is try to get the parties to reach an accommodation. So and you would do. love it then if that person's attorney reached out to you to do that mediation process, then it sounds like. I'm sorry? It sounds like your clients would love it if that borrower's attorney reached out to you to do that mediation process at the beginning of the process. You know, what, what we're doing now, we have two types of mediation. We have pre-file mediation and we have post-file mediation. Mm -hmm. 
And that's, that's occurring today. But, but in addition, when you look at the process, you can't foreclose until the loan's been in default for 90 days, okay? You, you send a notice of intent to foreclose out. You can't then file a foreclosure for 45 days after you send it. The Commissioner of Financial Regulation sends out the documents that I've attached, including here's the toll-free number that you can call to get help. And then you have to file, the lender has to file a loss mitigation affidavit, which sets forth what could be done for loss mitigation. And that's it's why you have these big process. numbers right. at the beginning and these small numbers at the end. We have 1.1 million mortgages in the state of Maryland. Um, last question. So at the mediation that you mentioned, which is the loss mitigation process, I don't want people to think it's separate or part of the same. Um, when the banks go to the mediation, they're there with their attorney, correct? The lender is typically the there with with an attorney. Okay. But, and, the and homeowner... I, but I will tell you, having been through them, once again, it's a mediation. And the mediator is an administrative law judge. And trust me, when that borrower comes to the table in the mediation, and if, if the lender is there with an attorney, that mediator is going to make sure there's a balance in the discussion and that the consumer, the borrower, understands exactly what's going on. And if he wants, he can postpone it. And, you know, once again, no borrower that is out there doesn't get told why they should, con you know, that, that, they, uh, that get, they do get told you should contact a counselor and get counseling. Right, but, in the but there's no such thing as free counseling for civil cases. Well, so but, they would have to pay for that out of their own pocket, correct? But this is a unique civil case. This is not a plaintiff and a defendant, okay? You don't have – these are the rules of procedure. Oh, I know. I'm very familiar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but that's just for foreclosure. It's a very unique process. Yep, Section 14 of the Maryland Rules, yep. Right. And it takes – once again, because of – the, the length that the Maryland law goes to to protect consumers and help them, we now have the fourth slowest foreclosure process in the country. I oh, know. It's lengthy. It's a little lengthy. Okay. Well, those are my questions. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. <laughs> All right. You're generating new questions. Uh, we've got um, Delegate Tolls and Simpson, and hopefully that's it. <laughs> yeah. I just second by the apple. So I, I do I do think that Delegate Williams, while we may be on a different side of some things, I'm consistent where I don't like fees. Uh, so I agree with, but I agree with you that basically to your point, homeowners should be able to have representation as well. So let me ask you a question. Um, do you all, when the homeowners are late and they have to go through pre-meditation, pre-mediation and they file 90 days, do the banks Oh, let me just rephrase it this way. The banks charge several fees and late notices and everything from, you know, having to maintain a property to other late fees. They do charge those fees every month and basically until they get current. Is that correct? Well, you know, every contract. Every, right. You know, so has, my question was. Okay, I'm going to answer. Okay. Every contract has late fees. Mm -hmm. So are there late fees? If you don't pay on time, yes. Okay. But, you know, right now, you know, the, you, you have your interest, you have your monthly payment, um, and, you know, that's what accrues. Right. I'm a homeowner. I know what, yeah. what I pay in escrow and what my interest right. is. But my question to you is, is it, it, isn't it correct that the banks charge fees to these individuals who are experiencing hardships, regardless if they're experiencing hardships, you charge astronomical fees for the maintain, so you don't charge any late fees on any property no. owner. Well, first of all, uh, with the all due with all due respect, delegate, you said astronomical fees. Okay, I'm happy to find out exactly what the fees are mm -hmm. that do get charged. But you have to understand that you know when a typically, if someone's not making their mortgage payment, that's probably not the only financial problem they're having. It may be the last thing that they don't pay. Mm -hmm. Um, these houses stay in foreclosure now for almost two years. It's, it's the bank's collateral, and the bank, in order to reduce its losses, um, you know, hopes that the property will be kept up, but very often it's not. So it's a problem. Well, 
Okay. So my question really wasn't answered, but I think that Delegate Charles found the fund where he could get the fees from, the banks. I'm sorry, say that again. Um, that's it. I'm having a hard time hearing you. Thank you. I didn't stutter. <laughs> I know you did, but yeah. my hearing's not great. I'm, I oh, apologize. You want me to repeat it? Sure, if you don't mind. That the bank, that Delegate Charles found the fund where he can get collect the fees from because banks do charge a lot of money not only fee from selling when you you know even to borrow for people to borrow the, the money is fees it's you know you do fees if folks are late you do fees to maintain the property and we have seen hardships because for whatever reason you know you mentioned that people can't pay their mortgage but some people have health care issues um that they fall behind on they have loss of jobs due to COVID and some other issues the banks chart the banks add pile on and pile on on those that are suffering. So my, no, I, I, I disagree. But I don't want to go back and forth. I disagree. Late. Okay, that's Thank fine. You. We can agree to disagree. Right. We Thank do. you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. <laughs> Delegate Simpson. So I'm looking at page three, and I will I will add that I definitely, while you were explaining, almost sounded jealous. I haven't had a foreclosure because I don't. I mean, you're saying it's friendly, but I can't imagine anybody thinking the process is friendly who's going through it. No, I, I, listen, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. It is a tough process to go through. The last thing you want to do is lose your home, and that's why we now have 100 pages of consumer protections in our foreclosure process, unlike most other states. And you've talked a lot about them being explained to or they're aware of. How are they aware of all of this? Okay, so when the notice of intent to foreclose is set. so. If I have trouble reading, well, if you can't read, I, I mean that's obviously that's going to be a, a problem if you can't read. I, I don't disagree. Or if I, I have care. trouble I, reading, I don't at care that what level. kind of meal you get. Or right. What? If I have trouble reading at that, and I even see on this page three, there's 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 kind of an opt out of the without the mediation. Are you sure that these people know that they even have this option of mediation and help? Okay. So if you look at this form, this is the form I'm referring to. Okay, mortgage loan, don't wait. Contact your mortgage servicer now. Um, help is available for Maryland homeowners. I mean, you know, we've gone out of our way to have a consumer-friendly form that says shows people this is where you can get assistance. Now, during the pandemic, what we typically did, and the numbers went way low, was, and we're still doing this, is depending on the situation, Many lenders will take, you know, whatever the unpaid, you know, amount is and tack it on to the back end of the mortgage. You know, we, we're looking at different options that we have to try to keep the borrower in the house. Okay. You say you have the order of docket. You go to court. Do you go to court without a lawyer? Do I? Yes. No, I am a lawyer. Okay. Do okay. you... <laughs> Go, does the banker go to court without a lawyer? We don't go to court typically on these cases. You know, these are these aren't. If you, if you look at the pleading in a in a in a foreclosure case, it's it's different. It's not, you know, Bob Enton uh, 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 versus Delegate Moon. Okay, plaintiff Bob Enton represented by so and so, defendant Moon represented by so and so. This is a case where, under Maryland law, in some states, you have non-judicial foreclosures. Maryland is what we call a quasi-judicial foreclosure state. It's somewhere in between, although now it's pretty close to judicial. So it's not bank versus moon. I know, but you just said yourself you're an attorney, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Every homeowner is not an attorney. I know, but that's why we, that's why, that's why we that's, have the process that we I'm have. I'm a trainer. That's a lot of words for somebody to read, to know. That what? is a lot of words. Mortgage late, don't wait. Contact your mortgage service. And our, the Honorable Delegate Charles is simply asking that people have representation, just as you have representation, okay. well, let me to fully this. understand the process. Delegate, let me just say this. What this bill is about, and all the witnesses in Could you move up to the microphone? I'm sorry. What this bill is about, and the witnesses in favor of it, were all from the Maryland Legal Services Corporation, okay? Their attorneys. And as I pointed out, last, last year, their funding went from $20 million to $33 million. All right? They have staff. They have people. They're providing this service today. 
They didn't come in and say they don't have the money to do this. They didn't come in and say they don't have the wherewithal to do it. But you got a bill that, that's going to make consumers pay $10 million a year in additional closing costs to go to, you know, to go into to, to, to their own legal services and legal aid. We just don't think it's necessary. So even looking at, you know, your page three, that to have somebody explain to someone and be able to understand that maybe to go without mediation is not such a great idea or no, to get the we, help. No, what we have is we have, a, and if, if, if somebody, if a consumer advocate thinks this form is not consumer friendly enough, and the Commissioner of Financial Regulation and the lenders and the foreclosure bar, and there's no one from the foreclosure bar here today. I'm not a foreclosure attorney. The foreclosure bar was happy to go back to the table and work on it and make it more consumer friendly. I understand that. I understand where you're coming from. I do. I oh, do. Good. And I feel for I feel for you. But I also you just rattled off a bunch of folks that I would imagine somebody who is having trouble financially needs an advocate. But you have to understand right. that. Hey, Let me hey, just, can I just respond yes, to this? Yeah, one quickly, more? briefly. This is not an adverse proceeding like that. They're not being sued, okay? This is, this is not so-and-so versus so-and-so. You have a process. It's a consumer-friendly process, and the bank is going to do everything it can because the last thing it wants to do is see the borrower out of the house. All right. Well, I... I think that's been a very robust philosophical discussion. Um, if we have additional questions, I hope you'll make yourself available. I am available to yep. every member of the committee. <laughs> uh, you have my, uh, my uh, contact info. Staff has it. I'm happy to meet with you and talk about this further and bring in some foreclosure lawyers to talk to you about it as well. Great. That's going to end the hearing on House Bill 225. Thank Good you. Good evening, everybody. I will see you tomorrow at 1.